The first book of Moses, commonly called Genesis. The creation. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created by forming from nothing the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, or a waste and emptiness, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, primeval ocean that covered the unformed earth. The Spirit of God was moving, hovering, brooding over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, pleasing, useful. And he affirmed and sustained it. And God separated the light, distinguishing it from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. And God said, Let there be an expanse of the sky in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters below the expanse from the waters above the expanse. And God made the expanse of sky, and separated the waters which were under the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so, just as he commanded. God called the expanse of sky heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. Then God said, Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, of standing, pooling together, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that this was good, pleasing, useful, and he affirmed and sustained it. So God said, Let the earth sprout tender vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit according to, limited to, consistent with, their kind, whose seed is in them upon the earth. And it was so. The earth sprouted and abundantly produced vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them according to their kind. And God saw that it was good, and he affirmed and sustained it. And there was evening, and there was morning, a third day. Then God said, Let there be light bearers, sun, moon, stars, in the expanse of the heavens, to separate the day from the night, and let them be useful for signs, tokens of God's provident care, and for marking seasons, days, and years. And let them be useful as lights in the expanse of the heavens, to provide light on the earth, and it was so, just as he commanded. God made the two great lights, the greater light, the sun, to rule the day, and the lesser light, the moon, to rule the night. He made the galaxies of stars also, that is, all the amazing wonders in the heavens. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to provide light upon the earth, to rule over the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and he affirmed and sustained it. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fourth day. Then God said, Let the waters swarm and abundantly produce living creatures, and let birds soar above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarmed according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and he affirmed and sustained it. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to, limited to, consistent with, their kind, livestock, crawling things, and wild animals of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so, because he had spoken them into creation. So God made the wild animals of the earth according to their kind, and the cattle according to their kind, and everything that creeps and crawls on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, pleasing, useful, and he affirmed and sustained it. Then God said, Let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, make man in our image, according to our likeness, not physical, but a spiritual personality and moral likeness, and let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, and over the entire earth, 
and over everything that creeps and crawls on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image and likeness of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, granting them certain authority, and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, and subjugate it, putting it under your power, and rule over, dominate the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living thing that moves upon the earth. So God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the entire earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you, and to all the animals on the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that moves on the ground, to everything in which there is the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so, because he commanded it. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and he validated it completely. And there was evening, and there was morning, a sixth day. Genesis 2, The Creation of Man and Woman So the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their host inhabitants. And by the seventh day God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested, seized on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. So God blessed the seventh day, and sanctified it as his own, that is, set it apart as holy from other days, because in it he rested from all his work which he had created and done. This is the history of the origin of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, in the day, that is, days of creation, that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. No shrub or plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground, but a mist, fog, dew, vapor, used to rise from the land and water the entire surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed, that is, created the body of man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being, an individual complete in body and spirit. And the Lord God planted a garden, oasis, in the east, in Eden, delight, land of happiness. And he put the man whom he had formed, created, there. And in that garden, the Lord God caused to grow from the ground every tree that is desirable and pleasing to the sight, and good, suitable, pleasant for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the experiential knowledge recognition of the difference between good and evil. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four branching rivers. The first river is named Pishon. It flows around the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Delium, a fragrant, valuable resin, and the onyx stone are found there. The name of the second river is Gion. It flows around the entire land of Cush in Mesopotamia. The third river is named Hidekel, Tigris. It flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. So the Lord God took the man he had made and settled him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may freely, unconditionally eat the fruit from every tree of the garden but only from the tree of the knowledge, recognition of good and evil, you shall not eat. Otherwise, on the day that you eat from it, you shall most certainly die because of your disobedience. Now the Lord God said, It is not good, beneficial, for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper, one who balances him, a counterpart who is suitable and complementary for him. So the Lord God formed out of the ground every animal of the field and every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper that was suitable, a companion for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And while he slept, 
he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made, fashioned, formed, into a woman. And he brought her and presented her to the man. Then Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and were not ashamed or embarrassed. Genesis 3 The Fall of Man Now the serpent was more crafty, subtle, skilled in deceit, than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. And the serpent, Satan, said to the woman, Can it really be that God has said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, except the fruit from the tree which is in the middle of the garden. God said, You shall not eat from it, nor touch it, otherwise you will die. But the serpent said to the woman, You certainly will not die, for God knows that on the day you eat from it your eyes will be opened. That is, you will have greater awareness, and you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was delightful to look at, and a tree to be desired in order to make one wise and insightful, she took some of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of the two of them were opened, that is, their awareness increased, and they knew that they were naked, and they fastened fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool afternoon breeze of the day. So the man and his wife hid and kept themselves hidden from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten fruit from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled and deceived me, and I ate from the forbidden tree. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle, and more than any animal of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, open hostility, between you and the woman, and between your seed, offspring, and her seed. He shall fatally bruise your head, and you shall only bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will give birth to children. Yet your desire and longing will be for your husband, and he will rule with authority over you and be responsible for you. Then to Adam the Lord God said, Because you have listened attentively to the voice of your wife, and have eaten fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. The ground is now under a curse because of you. In sorrow and toil you shall eat the fruit of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, until you return to the ground, for from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man named his wife Eve, life spring, life giver, because she was the mother of all the living. The Lord God made tunics of animal skins for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, knowing how to distinguish between good and evil, and now he might stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life as well, and eat its fruit, and live in this fallen sinful condition forever. Therefore the Lord God sent Adam away from the Garden of Eden, to till and cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So God drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he permanently stationed the cherubim and the sword with the flashing blade, which turned round and round in every direction to protect and guard the way, entrance, access to the tree of life. Genesis 4, Cain and Abel 
Now the man Adam knew Eve as his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have obtained a man, baby boy, son, with the help of the Lord. And later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept the flocks of sheep and goats, but Cain cultivated the ground. And in the course of time Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. But Abel brought an offering of the finest firstborn of his flock and the fat portions. And the Lord had respect, regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and his offering he had no respect. So Cain became extremely angry, indignant, and he looked annoyed and hostile. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you so angry, and why do you look annoyed? If you do well, believing me and doing what is acceptable and pleasing to me, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, but ignore my instruction, sin crouches at your door. Its desire is for you, to overpower you, but you must master it. Cain talked with Abel his brother about what God had said, and when they were alone, working in the field, Cain attacked Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he lied and said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's innocent blood is crying out to me from the ground for justice. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's shed blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength. It will resist producing crops for you. You shall be a fugitive and a vagabond, roaming aimlessly on the earth, in perpetual exile without a home, a degraded outcast. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me out this day from the face of the land, and from your face, presence, I will be hidden, and I will be a fugitive and an aimless vagabond on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, a sevenfold vengeance, that is, punishment seven times worse, shall be taken on him by me. And the Lord set a protective mark, sign, on Cain, so that no one who found met him would kill him. So Cain went away from the manifested presence of the Lord, and lived in the land of Nod, wandering in exile east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, one of Adam's descendants, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And Cain built a city and named it Enoch, after the name of his son. Now to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad became the father of Mehuyael, and Mehuyael became the father of Methushael, and Methushael became the father of Lamech, and Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He became the father of those nomadic herdsmen who live in tents, and have cattle and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He became the father of all those musicians who play the lyre and flute. Zillah gave birth to Tubal Cain, the smith, craftsman, and teacher of every artisan in instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say, for I have killed a man merely for wounding me and a boy only for striking, bruising me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold as the Lord said he would be, then Lamech will be avenged seventy-sevenfold. Adam knew Eve as his wife again, and she gave birth to a son, and named him Seth. For she said, God has granted another child for me in place of Abel, because Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, whom he named Enosh, mortal man, mankind. At that same time, men began to call on the name of the Lord in worship through prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. Genesis 5, Descendants of Adam. This is the book, the written record, the history of the generations of the descendants of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God, not physical, but a spiritual personality and moral likeness. He created them male and female and blessed them, and named them mankind at the time they were created. When Adam had lived a hundred and thirty years, he became the father of a son, 
in his own likeness according to his image and named him Seth. After he became the father of Seth, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. So Adam lived 930 years in all, and he died. When Seth was 105 years old, he became the father of Enosh. Seth lived 807 years after the birth of Enosh, and he had other sons and daughters. So Seth lived 912 years, and he died. When Enosh was 90 years old, he became the father of Canaan. Enosh lived 815 years after the birth of Canaan, and had other sons and daughters. So Enosh lived 905 years, and he died. When Canaan was 70 years old, he became the father of Mahalalil. Canaan lived 840 years after the birth of Mahalalil, and had other sons and daughters. So Canaan lived 910 years, and he died. When Mahalalil was 65 years old, he became the father of Jared. Mahalalil lived 830 years after the birth of Jared, and had other sons and daughters. So Mahalalil lived 895 years, and he died. When Jared was 162 years old, he became the father of Enoch. Jared lived 800 years after the birth of Enoch, and had other sons and daughters. So Jared lived 962 years, and he died. When Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked in habitual fellowship with God 300 years after the birth of Methuselah and had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and in reverent fear and obedience, Enoch walked with God, and he was not found among men, because God took him away to be home with him. When Methuselah was 187 years old, he became the father of Lamech. Methuselah lived 782 years after the birth of Lamech, and had other sons and daughters. So Methuselah lived 969 years, and he died. When Lamech was 182 years old, he became the father of a son. He named him Noah, saying, This one shall bring us rest and comfort from our work and from the dreadful toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord cursed. Lamech lived 595 years after the birth of Noah and had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were seven hundred and seventy-seven years, and he died. After Noah was five hundred years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Genesis 6, The Corruption of Mankind Now it happened, when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and desirable, and they took wives for themselves whomever they chose and desired. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive and remain with man forever, because he is indeed flesh, sinful, corrupt, given over to sensual appetites. Nevertheless, his days shall yet be a hundred and twenty years. There were Nephilim, men of stature, notorious men, on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God lived with the daughters of men, and they gave birth to their children. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown, great reputation, fame. The Lord saw that the wickedness, depravity of man was great on the earth, and that every imagination or intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. The Lord regretted that he had made mankind on the earth, and he was deeply grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy, annihilate mankind whom I have created from the surface of the earth, not only man, but the animals and the crawling things and the birds of the air, because it deeply grieves me to see mankind sin, and I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor and grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of the generation's family history of Noah. Noah was a righteous man one who was just and had right standing with God, blameless in his evil generation. Noah walked, lived, and habitual fellowship with God. Now Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The population of the earth was corrupt, absolutely depraved, 
spiritually and morally putrid, in God's sight, and the land was filled with violence, desecration, infringement, outrage, assault, and lust for power. God looked on the earth and saw how debased and degenerate it was, for all humanity had corrupted their way on the earth and lost their true direction. God said to Noah, I intend to make an end of all that lives. For through men the land is filled with violence, and behold, I am about to destroy them together with the land. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make it in rooms, stalls, pens, coops, nests, cages, compartments, and coat it inside and out with pitch. Bidumen, this is the way you are to make it. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, its width fifty cubits, and its height thirty cubits. 450 feet by 75 feet by 45 feet. You shall make a window for light and ventilation for the ark, and finish it to at least a cubit 18 inches from the top, and set the entry door of the ark in its side, and you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I, even I, will bring a flood of waters on the earth, to destroy all life under the heavens, in which there is the breath and spirit of life. Everything that is on the land shall die, but I will establish my covenant, solemn promise, formal agreement with you, and you shall come into the ark, you and your three sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing found on land you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of fowls and birds according to their kind, of animals according to their kind, of every crawling thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every kind shall come to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every kind of food that is edible, and you shall collect and store it, and it shall be food for you and for them. So Noah did this, according to all that God commanded him. That is what he did. Genesis 7, The Flood Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you with all your household, for you alone I have seen as righteous, doing what is right, before me in this generation. Of every clean animal you shall take with you seven pair, the male and his female, and of animals that are not clean, two each the male and his female. Also of the birds of the air, seven pair, the male and the female, to keep the offspring alive on the surface of the earth. For in seven days I am going to cause it to rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and I will destroy, blot out, wipe away every living thing that I have made from the surface of the earth. So Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old when the flood, deluge, of water came on the earth, covering all of the land. Then Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him entered the ark to escape the flood waters. Of clean animals and animals that are not clean, and birds and fowls and everything that crawls on the ground, they came, motivated by God, into the ark with Noah, two by two, the male and the female, just as God had commanded Noah. And after the seven days, God released the rain and the flood waters came on the earth. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, on the seventeenth day of the second month, on that same day all the fountains of the great deep, subterranean waters, burst open, and the windows and floodgates of the heavens were opened. It rained on the earth for forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark, they and every animal according to its kind, all the livestock according to their kind, every moving thing that crawls on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged thing of every sort. So they went into the ark with Noah, two by two of all living beings in which there was the breath and spirit of life. Those which entered, male and female, of all flesh, creatures, entered as God had commanded Noah, and the Lord closed the door behind him. The flood, the great downpour of rain, was forty days and nights on the earth, and the waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it floated high above the land. The waters became mighty and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the waters." 
the waters prevailed so greatly and were so mighty and overwhelming on the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. In fact, the waters became fifteen cubits higher than the highest ground, and the mountains were covered. All living beings that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle, domestic animals, wild animals, all things that swarm and crawl on the earth, and all mankind, everything on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath and spirit of life, died. God destroyed, blotted out, wiped away every living thing that was on the surface of the earth. Man and animals and the crawling things and the birds of the heavens were destroyed from the land. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. The waters covered all of the earth for a hundred and fifty days, five months. Genesis 8, The Flood Abates And God remembered and thought kindly of Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the land, and the waters receded. Also the fountains of the deep, subterranean waters, and the windows of the heavens were closed. The pouring rain from the sky was restrained, and the waters receded steadily from the earth. At the end of a hundred and fifty days, the waters had diminished. On the seventeenth day of the seventh month, five months after the rain began, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat in Turkey. The waters continued to decrease until the tenth month. On the first day of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains were seen. At the end of another forty days, Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he sent out a raven, which flew here and there until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then Noah sent out a dove to see if the water level had fallen below the surface of the land. But the dove found no place on which to rest the sole of her foot, and she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the entire earth. So he reached out his hand and took the dove and brought her into the ark. He waited another seven days and again sent the dove out from the ark. The dove came back to him in the evening, and there in her beak was a fresh olive leaf. So Noah knew that the water level had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent out the dove, but she did not return to him again. Now in the six hundredth and first year of Noah's life, on the first day of the first month, the waters were drying up from the earth. Then Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and the surface of the ground was drying. On the twenty-seventh day of the second month, the land was entirely dry. And God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing from all flesh, birds and animals and every crawling thing that crawls on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his wife and his sons and their wives with him, after being in the ark one year and ten days. Every animal, every crawling thing, every bird, and whatever moves on the land went out by families, types, groupings from the ark. And Noah built an altar to the Lord, and took of every ceremonially clean animal, and of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, a soothing, satisfying scent. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intent, strong inclination, desire of man's heart is wicked from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Genesis 9, Covenant of the Rainbow And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear and the terror of you shall be instinctive in every animal of the land and in every bird of the air, and together with everything that moves on the ground, and with all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I give you everything, as I gave you the green plants and vegetables. But you shall not eat meat along with its life, that is, its blood. For your lifeblood I will most certainly require an accounting. 
From every animal that kills a person, I will require it. And from man, from every man's brother, that is, any one who murders, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood unlawfully, by man, judicial government, shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God he made man. As for you, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, Now behold, I am establishing my covenant, binding agreement, solemn promise, with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and the wild animals of the earth along with you, of everything that comes out of the ark, every living creature of the earth. I will establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the water of a flood, nor shall there ever again be a flood to destroy and ruin the earth. And God said, This is the token, visible symbol, memorial, of the solemn covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I set my rainbow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come about when I bring clouds over the earth, that the rainbow shall be seen in the clouds, and I will compassionately remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again will the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the rainbow is in the clouds and I look at it, I will solemnly remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This rainbow is the sign of the covenant, solemn pledge, binding agreement, which I have established between me and all living things on the earth. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. Ham would become the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and from these men the whole earth was populated and scattered with inhabitants. And Noah began to farm and cultivate the ground, and he planted a vineyard. He drank some of the wine and became drunk, and he was uncovered and lay exposed inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw by accident the nakedness of his father, and to his father's shame told his two brothers outside. So Shem and Japheth took a robe and put it on both their shoulders and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine-induced stupor, he knew what his younger son Ham had done to him. So he said, Cursed be Canaan the son of Ham, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge the land of Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Noah lived three hundred and fifty years after the flood, so all the days of Noah were nine hundred and fifty years, and he died. Genesis 10 Descendants of Noah These are the records of the generations, descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and the sons born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togarma. The sons of Javan, Elasha, Tarshish, Ketim, and Dodanim. From these, the people of the coastlands of the nations were separated and spread into their lands, everyone according to his own language, according to their constituent groups, families, and into their nations. The sons of Ham, Cush, Mizrim, from whom descended the Egyptians, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havela, Sabta, Rama, and Sabteca and the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalneh, in the land of Shinar, in Babylonia. 
From that land Nimrod went to Assyria and built Nevia, and Rehobothir and Kala. And Nimrod built Rizin, which is between Nevia and Kala. All these combined to form the great city Nevia. Mizrim, the ancestor of the Egyptians, became the father of Ludim, Anamim, Lehabim, Natuhim, and Pathrazim, and Kazluhim, from whom came the Philistines, and Kafturim. Canaan became the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jezebite, and the Amorite, and the Girgashite, and the Hevite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvadite, and the Zimorite, and the Hamathite. Afterward the families of the Canaanite were spread abroad. The territory of the Canaanite extended from Sidon as one goes to Gerar, as far as Gaza, and as one goes to Sodom and Gomorrah and Admah and Zeboim as far as Lasha. These are the descendants of Ham according to their constituent groups, according to their languages, by their lands, and by their nations. Also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, including the Hebrews, the older brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem, Elam, Ashur, Arpachshad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram, ancestor of the Syrians, Uz, Hul, Gither, and Mash. Arpachshad became the father of Shelah, and Shelah became the father of Eber. Two sons were born to Eber. The name of one was Peleg, division, for the inhabitants of the earth were divided in his days, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan became the father of Almodad, Shilef, Hazarmaveth, Jera, and Hadoram, Uzal, Daikla, and Obal, Abimel, Sheba, and Ophir, Havela, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. Now their territory extended from Misha, as one goes toward Sephar, to the hill country of the east. These are Shem's descendants according to their constituent groups, families, according to their languages, by their lands, according to their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, according to their descendants, by their nations, and from these people the nations were separated and spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Genesis 11 Universal Language, Babel, Confusion Now the whole earth spoke one language, and used the same words, vocabulary. And as people journeyed eastward, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. They said one to another, Come, let us make bricks, and fire them thoroughly in a kiln, to harden and strengthen them. So they used brick for stone as building material, and they used tar, bitumen, asphalt for mortar. They said, Come, let us build a city for ourselves, and a tower whose top will reach into the heavens, and let us make a famous name for ourselves, so that we will not be scattered into separate groups, and be dispersed over the surface of the entire earth as the Lord instructed. Now the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one unified people, and they all have the same language. This is only the beginning of what they will do in rebellion against me. And now no evil thing they imagine they can do will be impossible for them. Come, let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, go down and there confuse and mix up their language, so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the surface of the entire earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore the name of the city was Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the entire earth, and from that place the Lord scattered and dispersed them over the surface of all the earth. Descendants of Shem These are the records of the generations of Shem, from whom Abraham descended. Shem was a hundred years old when he became the father of Arpachshad, two years after the flood. And Shem lived five hundred years after Arpachshad was born, and he had other sons and daughters. When Arpachshad had lived thirty-five years, he became the father of Shelah. Arpachshad lived four hundred and three years after Shelah was born, and he had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived thirty years, he became the father of Eber. 
Shelah lived 403 years after Eber was born, and he had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he became the father of Peleg, and Eber lived 430 years after Peleg was born, and he had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he became the father of Ru, and Peleg lived 209 years after Ru was born, and he had other sons and daughters. When Ru had lived 32 years, he became the father of Surig, and Ru lived 207 years after Surig was born, and he had other sons and daughters. When Surig had lived 30 years, he became the father of Naor, and Surig lived 200 years after Naor was born, and he had other sons and daughters. When Naor lived 29 years, he became the father of Terah, and Naor lived 119 years after Terah was born, and he had other sons and daughters. After Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram, and Naor and Haran his firstborn. Now these are the records of the descendants of Terah. Terah was the father of Abram, Abraham, Naor, and Haran, and Haran was the father of Lot. Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his birth, in Ur of the Chaldeans. Abram and Naor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, later called Sarah, and the name of Naor's wife was Milcah the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Ishka. But Sarai was barren. She did not have a child. Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went out together to go from Ur of the Chaldeans into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, about five hundred and fifty miles northwest of Ur, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Genesis 12 Abram journeys to Egypt. Now in Haran the Lord had said to Abram, Go away from your country, and from your relatives, and from your father's house, to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you abundantly, and make your name great, exalted, distinguished, and you shall be a blessing, a source of great good to others. And I will bless, do good for, benefit those who bless you. And I will curse, that is, subject to my wrath and judgment, the one who curses, despises, dishonors, has contempt for you. And in you all the families, nations of the earth will be blessed. So Abram departed in faithful obedience as the Lord had directed him, and Lot his nephew left with him. Abram was seventy-five years old when he left Haran. Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his nephew, and all their possessions which they had acquired, and the people, servants which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem, to the great Terebinth oak tree of Moreh. Now the Canaanites were in the land at that time. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. So Abram built an altar there to honor the Lord who had appeared to him. Then he moved on from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord in worship through prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. Then Abram journeyed on, continuing toward the Negev, the south country of Judah. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to live temporarily, for the famine in the land was oppressive and severe. And when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai his wife, Listen, I know that you are a beautiful woman, so when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me to acquire you, but they will let you live. Please tell them that you are my sister, so that things will go well for me for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. And when Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was very beautiful. Pharaoh's princes, officials, also saw her and praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken for the purpose of marriage into Pharaoh's house, Haram. Therefore Pharaoh treated Abram well for her sake. He acquired sheep, oxen, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. 
But the Lord punished Pharaoh and his household with severe plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Then Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say, She is my sister, so that I took her as my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they escorted him on his way, with his wife and all that he had. Genesis 13. Abram and Lot. So Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot his nephew with him into the Negev, the south country of Judah. Now Abram was extremely rich in livestock and in silver and in gold. He journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, where he had first built an altar, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord in prayer. But Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them, that is, sustain all their grazing and water needs, while they lived near one another. For their possessions were too great for them to stay together. And there was strife and quarreling between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were living in the land at that same time, making grazing of the livestock difficult. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife and disagreement between you and me, nor between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, because we are relatives. Is not the entire land before you? Please separate yourself from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right, or if you choose the right, then I will go to the left. So Lot looked and saw that the valley of the Jordan was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was all like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go to Zor at the south end of the Dead Sea. Then Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and he traveled east, so they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, and Lot settled in the cities of the valley and camped as far as Sodom and lived there. But the men of Sodom were extremely wicked and sinful against the Lord, unashamed in their open sin before him. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had left him, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are standing, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see I will give to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as numerous as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could count the grains of dust of the earth, then your descendants could also be counted. Arise, walk, make a thorough reconnaissance around in the land, through its length and its width, for I will give it to you. Then Abram broke camp and moved his tent, and came and settled by the grove of the great Terebinth oak trees of Mamre, the Amorite, which are in Hebron, and there he built an altar to honor the Lord. Genesis 14, War of the Kings In the days of the eastern kings, Amraphel of Shinar, Arioch of Elasar, Kedeleomer of Elam, and Tidal of Goyim, they invaded the Jordan Valley near the Dead Sea, and made war with Bera king of Sodom, Birsha king of Gomorrah, Shinab king of Adma, Shimember king of Ziboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor. All of these kings joined together as allies in the valley of Sidim, that is, the Sea of Salt. Twelve years they had served Kedeleomar, the most powerful king in the invading confederacy, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year Kedeleomar, and the three kings who were with him attacked and subdued the Rephaim in Ashiroth Karanim, the Zuzim in Ham, and the Imim in Shave Keriathim, and the Horites in the mountainous country of Seir, as far as Il Paran, which is on the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to In Mishvat, that is Kadesh, and subdued all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who lived in Hazazon Tamar. Then the kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Ziboim, and Bela, that is Zor, came out, and they joined together for battle with the invading kings in the valley of Sidim. 
against Kedele Omar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elasar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of tar, Bitumin pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, they fell into them. But the remainder of the kings who survived fled to the hill country. Then the victors took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their food supply and provisions, and left. And they also took captive Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions, and left, for he was living in Sodom. Then a survivor, who had escaped from the invading forces on the other side of the Jordan, came and told Abram the Hebrew, now he was living by the Terebinth's oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshkol and brother of Aner. They were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his nephew Lot had been captured, he armed and led out his trained men, born in his own house, numbering 318, and went in pursuit as far north as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and attacked and defeated them, and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought back his nephew Lot and his possessions, and also the women and the people, Abram and Melchizedek. Then, after Abram's return from the defeat, slaughter of Kedaleomar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. Melchizedek, king of Salem, ancient Jerusalem, brought out bread and wine for them. He was the priest of God Most High. And Melchizedek blessed Abram and said, Blessed, joyful, favored be Abram by God Most High, creator and possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed, praised, and glorified be God Most High, who has given your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of all the treasure he had taken in battle. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods, spoils of battle for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand and sworn an oath to the Lord God Most High, the creator and possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take anything that is yours, from a thread to a sandal strap, so you could not say, I, the king of Sodom, have made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what my young men have eaten, and the share of my spoils belonging to the men, my allies, who went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their share of the spoils. Genesis 15. Abram promised a son. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward for obedience shall be very great. Abram said, Lord God, what reward will you give me, since I am leaving this world childless, and he who will be the owner and heir of my house is this servant Eliezer from Damascus? And Abram continued, Since you have given no child to me, one, a servant born in my house, is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man, Eliezer, will not be your heir, but he who shall come from your own body shall be your heir. And the Lord brought Abram outside his tent into the night, and said, Look now toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, So numerous shall your descendants be. Then Abram believed in, affirmed, trusted in, relied on, remained steadfast to the Lord, and he counted, credited it to him as righteousness, doing right in regard to God and man. And he said to him, I am the same Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land as an inheritance. But Abram said, Lord God, by what proof will I know that I will inherit it? So God said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So Abram brought all these to him and cut them down the middle and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey swooped down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. When the sun was setting, a deep sleep overcame Abram, and a horror, terror, shuddering fear, nightmare of great darkness overcame him. God said to Abram, 
know for sure that your descendants will be strangers living temporarily in a land, Egypt, that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for four hundred years. But on that nation whom your descendants will serve, I will bring judgment, and afterward they will come out of that land with great possessions. As for you, you shall die and go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation your descendants shall return here to Canaan, the land of promise. For the wickedness and guilt of the Amorites is not yet complete, finished. When the sun had gone down and a deep darkness had come, there appeared a smoking brazier and a flaming torch which passed between the divided pieces of the animals. On the same day the Lord made a covenant, promise, pledge, with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Kadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaim, the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jezebites. Genesis 16, Sarai and Hagar. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not borne him any children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See here, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. I am asking you to go into the bed of my maid, so that she may bear you a child. Perhaps I will obtain children by her. And Abram listened to Sarai and did as she said. After Abram had lived in the land of Canaan ten years, Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar the Egyptian maid and gave her to her husband Abram to be his secondary wife. He went into the bed of Hagar, and she conceived. And when she realized that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress regarding Sarai as insignificant because of her infertility. Then Sarai said to Abram, May the responsibility for the wrong done to me by the arrogant behavior of Hagar be upon you. I gave my maid into your arms, and when she realized that she had conceived, I was despised and looked on with disrespect. May the Lord judge who has done right between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Look, your maid is entirely in your hands and subject to your authority. Do as you please with her. So Sarai treated her harshly and humiliated her, and Hagar fled from her. But the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness on the road to Egypt by way of Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where did you come from, and where are you going? And she said, I am running away from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Go back to your mistress, and submit humbly to her authority. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants, so that they will be too many to count. The angel of the Lord continued, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son, and you shall name him Ishmael. God hears because the Lord has heard and paid attention to your persecution, suffering. He, Ishmael, will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against every man continually fighting, and every man's hand against him, and he will dwell in defiance of all his brothers. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are God, who sees. For she said, have I not even here in the wilderness remained alive after seeing him who sees me with understanding and compassion? Therefore the well was called Bir Lahairoi, well of the living one who sees me. It is between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar gave birth to Abram's son, and Abram named his son to whom Hagar gave birth, Ishmael, God hears. Abram was eighty-six years old when Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. Genesis 17, Abraham and the Covenant of Circumcision When Abram was ninety-nine years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk habitually before me with integrity, knowing that you are always in my presence, and be blameless and complete in obedience to me. I will establish my covenant, everlasting promise between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly through your descendants. Then Abram fell on his face in worship, and God spoke with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and as a result you shall be the father of many nations. 
No longer shall your name be Abram, exalted father, but your name shall be Abraham, father of a multitude. For I will make you the father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, moving from place to place, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession of property, and I will be their God. Further, God said to Abraham, As for you, your part of the agreement you shall keep and faithfully obey the terms of my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is the sign of my covenant, which you shall keep and faithfully obey between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be the sign, symbol, memorial of the covenant between me and you. Every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations, including a servant, whether born in the house or one who is purchased with your money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants. A servant who is born in your house or one who is purchased with your money must be circumcised, and the sign of my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, my princess, but her name will be Sarah, princess. I will bless her, and indeed I will also give you a son by her. Yes, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, kings of people will come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed, and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, O oh, that Ishmael my firstborn might live before you. But God said, No, Sarah your wife shall bear you a son indeed, and you shall name him Isaac, laughter, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard and listened to you. Behold, I will bless him and will make him fruitful and will greatly multiply him through his descendants. He will be the father of twelve princes, chieftains, sheiks, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant, my promise, my solemn pledge, I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. And God finished speaking with him and went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all the servants who were born in his house, and all who were purchased with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's household, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin the very same day, as God had said to him. So Abraham was ninety-nine years old when he was circumcised, and Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised. On the very same day, Abraham was circumcised as well as Ishmael his son. All the men, servants of his household, both those born in the house and those purchased with money from a foreigner, were circumcised along with him as the sign of God's covenant with Abraham. Genesis 18 Birth of Isaac Promised now the Lord appeared to Abraham by the Terebinth trees of Mamre in Hebron, while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he raised his eyes and looked up, behold, three men were standing a little distance from him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. And Abraham said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass by your servant without stopping to visit. Please let a little water be brought by one of my servants, and you may wash your feet, and recline and rest comfortably under the tree. And I will bring a piece of bread to refresh and sustain you. After that you may go on, since you have come to your servant. And they replied, Do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, get ready three measures of fine meal, knead it and bake cakes. 
Abraham also ran to the herd and brought a calf, tender and choice, and he gave it to the servant to butcher, and he hurried to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk, and the calf which he had prepared, and set it before the men. And he stood beside them under the tree while they ate. Then they said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, There in the tent. He said, I will surely return to you at this time next year, and behold, Sarah your wife will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in years. She was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself when she heard the Lord's words, saying, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure and delight, my Lord, husband, being also old? And the Lord asked Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh to herself, saying, Shall I really give birth to a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult or too wonderful for the Lord? At the appointed time, when the season for her delivery comes, I will return to you, and Sarah will have a son. Then Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, because she was afraid. And he, the Lord, said, No, but you did laugh. Then the men got up from there and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham walked with them to send them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I keep secret from Abraham, my friend and servant, what I am going to do? Since Abraham is destined to become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I have known, chosen, acknowledged him as my own, so that he may teach and command his children and the sons of his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is righteous and just, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has promised him. And the Lord said, The outcry of the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now, and see whether they have acted as vilely and wickedly as the outcry which has come to me indicates, and if not, I will know. Now the two men, angelic beings, turned away from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Abraham approached the Lord and said, Will you really sweep away the righteous, those who do right, with the wicked, those who do evil? Suppose there are fifty righteous people within the city. Will you really sweep it away and not spare it for the sake of the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to strike the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right by executing just and righteous judgment? So the Lord said, If I find within the city of Sodom fifty righteous people, then I will spare the entire place for their sake. Abraham answered, Now behold, I who am but dust in origin and ashes have decided to speak to the Lord. If five of the fifty righteous are lacking, will you destroy the entire city for lack of five? And he said, If I find at least forty-five righteous people there, I will not destroy it. Abraham spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose only forty are found there. And he said, I will not do it for the sake of the forty who are righteous. Then Abraham said to him, O oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty righteous people are found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Now behold, I have decided to speak to the Lord again. Suppose only twenty righteous people are found there. And the Lord said, I will not destroy it for the sake of the twenty. Then Abraham said, O oh, may the Lord not be angry with me, and I will speak only this once. Suppose ten righteous people are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of the ten. As soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, the Lord departed, and Abraham returned to his own place. Genesis 19, The Doom of Sodom It was evening when the two angels came to Sodom. Lot was sitting at Sodom's city gate. Seeing them, Lot got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. And he said, See here, my lords, please turn aside and come into your servant's house, and spend the night, and wash your feet. Then you may get up early and go on your way. But they said, No, we shall spend the night in the open plaza of the city. However, Lot strongly urged them, so they turned aside and entered his house. And he prepared a feast for them with wine and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down to sleep, 
the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house, all the men from every quarter. And they called out to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them intimately. But Lot went out of the doorway to the men and shut the door after him and said, Please, my brothers, do not do something so wicked. See here, I have two daughters who have not known a man intimately. Please let me bring them out to you instead, and you can do as you please with them. Only do nothing to these men, because they have in fact come under the shelter of my roof for protection. But they said, Get out of the way. And they said, This man, Lot, came as an outsider to live here temporarily, and now he is acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than your visitors. So they rushed forward and pressed violently against Lot and came close to breaking down the door of his house. But the men, angels, reached out with their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door after him. They struck, punished the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, from the young men to the old men, so that they exhausted themselves trying to find the doorway. And the two men, angels, asked Lot, have you any others here in Sodom, a son-in-law, and your sons, and your daughters? Whomever you have in the city, take them out of here, for we are destroying this place, because the outcry for judgment against them has grown so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy and ruin it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were betrothed and legally promised to marry his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place. For the Lord is about to destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he appeared to be joking. When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Get up, take your wife and two daughters who are here, and go, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But Lot hesitated and lingered. The men took hold of his hand, and the hand of his wife, and the hands of his two daughters, because the Lord was merciful to him, for Abraham's sake. And they brought him out and left him outside the city with his family. When they had brought them outside, one of the angels said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, or stop anywhere in the entire valley. Escape to the mountains of Moab, or you will be consumed and swept away. But Lot said to them, Oh no, not that place, my lords. Please listen, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have magnified your loving kindness, mercy, to me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, because the disaster will overtake me and I will be killed. Now look, this town in the distance is near enough for us to flee to, and it is small, with only a few people. Please let me escape there, is it not small? So that my life will be saved. And the angel said to him, Behold, I grant you this request also, I will not destroy this town of which you have spoken. Hurry and take refuge there. For I cannot do anything to punish Sodom until you arrive there. For this reason the town was named Zor, few, small. The sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zor. Then the Lord rained down brimstone, flaming sulfur and fire on Sodom and on Gomorrah, from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew, demolished, ended those cities, and the entire valley, and all the inhabitants of the cities, and whatever grew on the ground. But Lot's wife, from behind him, foolishly, longingly, looked back toward Sodom in an act of disobedience, and she became a pillar of salt. Abraham started out early the next morning to the place where he, only the day before, had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the valley of the Dead Sea. And he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a kiln, pottery furnace. Now when God ravaged and destroyed the cities of the plain of Sidim, he remembered Abraham, and for that reason, and he sent Abraham's nephew Lot out of the midst of the destruction, when he destroyed the cities in which Lot had lived. Lot is debased. Now Lot went up from Zor, and lived in the mountain together with his two daughters, for he was afraid to stay any longer in Zor, and he lived in a cave with his two daughters. The firstborn said to the younger, our father is aging, and there is not a man on earth available to be intimate with us in the customary way, so that we may have children. Come, let us make our father drunk with wine, 
and we will lie with him so that we may preserve our family through our father. So they gave their father wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she got up, because he was completely intoxicated. Then the next day the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drunk with wine tonight also, and then you go in and lie with him, so that we may preserve our family through our father. So they gave their father wine that night also, and the younger got up and lay with him, and again he did not know when she lay down or when she got up. Thus both the daughters of Lot conceived by their father. The firstborn gave birth to a son and named him Moab from father. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger also gave birth to a son and named him Ben-Ami, son of my people. He is the father of the Ammonites to this day. Genesis 20, Abraham's Deception now Abraham journeyed from there toward the Negev, the south country, and settled between Kadesh and Shur. Then he lived temporarily in Gerar. Abraham said again of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. So Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah into his harem. But God came to Abimelech in a dream during the night, and said, Behold, you are a dead man, because of the woman whom you have taken as your wife, for she is another man's wife. Now Abimelech had not yet come near her. So he said, Lord, will you kill a people who are righteous and innocent and blameless regarding Sarah? Did Abraham not tell me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know you did this in the integrity of your heart. For it was I who kept you back and spared you from sinning against me. Therefore I did not give you an opportunity to touch her. So now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you and you will live. But if you do not return her to him, know that you shall die, you and all who are yours, your household. So Abimelech got up early in the morning and called all his servants and told them all these things. And the men were terrified. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I offended you that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me what ought not to be done to anyone. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What have you encountered or seen in us or our customs that you have done this unjust thing? Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely there is no fear or reverence of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she actually is my half-sister. She is the daughter of my father, Terah, but not of my mother, and she became my wife. When God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, This kindness and loyalty you can show me. At every place we stop, say of me, He is my brother. Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male and female slaves and gave them to Abraham and returned Sarah his wife to him as God commanded. So Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Settle wherever you please. Then to Sarah he said, Look, I have given this brother of yours a thousand pieces of silver. It is to compensate you for all that has happened, and to vindicate your honor before all who are with you. Before all men you are cleared and compensated. So Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maids, and they again gave birth to children. For the Lord had securely closed the wombs of all the women in Abimelech's household because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Genesis 21 Isaac is born. The Lord graciously remembered and visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for her as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age, at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham named his son Isaac, Laughter the son to whom Sarah gave birth. So Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, just as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born. Sarah said, God has made me laugh. All who hear about our good news will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have given birth to a son by him in his old age. The child Isaac grew and was weaned, and Abraham held a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Sarah turns against Hagar. 
Now as time went on, Sarah saw Ishmael the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking Isaac. Therefore she said to Abraham, Drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. The situation distressed Abraham greatly because of his son Ishmael. God said to Abraham, Do not let it distress you because of Ishmael and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her, and do what she asks. For your descendants will be named through Isaac. And I will also make a nation of Ishmael, the son of the maid, because he is your descendant. So Abraham got up early in the morning, and took bread and a skin of water, and gave them to Hagar, putting them on her shoulder, and gave her the boy, and sent her away. And she left, but lost her way, and wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was all gone, Hagar abandoned the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him, about a bow shot away, for she said, Do not let me see the boy die. And as she sat down opposite him, she raised her voice and wept. God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy from where he is resting. Get up, help the boy up, and hold him by the hand, for I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw the well of water, and she went and filled the empty skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with Ishmael, and he grew and developed, and he lived in the wilderness and became an expert archer. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Covenant with Abimelech Now at that time Abimelech and Pekol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in everything you do. So now swear to me here by God that you will not deal unfairly with me by breaking any agreements we have, or with my son or with my descendants, but as I have treated you with kindness, you shall do the same to me and to the land in which you have sojourned, temporarily lived. And Abraham said, I will swear. Then Abraham complained to Abimelech about a well of water which the servants of Abimelech had violently seized from him. Abimelech said, I do not know who did this thing. Indeed, you did not tell me, and I did not hear of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant binding agreement. Then Abraham set apart seven ewe lambs of the flock. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs which you have set apart? Abraham said, You are to accept these seven ewe lambs from me as a witness for me, that I dug this well. Therefore that place was called Beersheba, well of the oath, or well of the seven, because there the two of them swore an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Pekol, the commander of his army, got up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba, and there he called on the name of the Lord in prayer, the Eternal God. And Abraham lived as a resident alien in the land of the Philistines for many days. Genesis 22 The Offering of Isaac now after these things, God tested the faith and commitment of Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he answered, Here I am. God said, Take now your son, your only son of promise, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he split the wood for the burnt offering, and then he got up and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day of travel, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Abraham said to his servants, Settle down and stay here with the donkey. The young man and I will go over there and worship God, and we will come back to you. Then Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, and laid it on the shoulders of Isaac his son. And he took the fire, fire pot, in his own hand, and the sacrificial knife, and the two of them walked on together. And Isaac said to Abraham, My father! And he said, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So the two walked on together. 
When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there, and arranged the wood, and bound Isaac his son, and placed him on the altar, on top of the wood. Abraham reached out his hand, and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. He answered, Here I am. The Lord said, Do not reach out with the knife in your hand against the boy, and do nothing to harm him. For now I know that you fear God with reverence and profound respect, since you have not withheld from me your son, your only son of promise. Then Abraham looked up and glanced around, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering, ascending sacrifice instead of his son. So Abraham named that place the Lord will provide, and it is said to this day, On the mountain of the Lord it will be seen and provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, By myself, on the basis of who I am, I have sworn an oath, declares the Lord, that since you have done this thing and have not withheld from me your son, your only son of promise, indeed I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your descendants like the stars of the heavens and like the sand on the seashore and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies as conquerors. Through your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have heard and obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his servants, and they got up and went with him to Beersheba, and Abraham settled in Beersheba. Now after these things Abraham was told, Milcah has borne children to your brother Naor, Uz the firstborn, and Buzz his brother, and Kemuel the father of Aram. Chezd and Hazo and Pildash, and Jedlap and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. These eight children Milcah bore to Naor, Abraham's brother. Naor's concubine, whose name was Rumah, gave birth to Teba, and Gaham, and Tahash, and Makkah. Genesis 23 Death and Burial of Sarah. Sarah lived a hundred and twenty seven years. This was the length of the life of Sarah. Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, that is, Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Then Abraham stood up before his dead wife's body and spoke to the sons of Heth, Hiddies, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner, resident alien among you. Give, sell me property for a burial place among you so that I may bury my dead in the proper manner. The Hiddies replied to Abraham, Listen to us, my lord. You are a prince of God, a mighty prince, among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our graves. None of us will refuse you his grave or hinder you from burying your dead wife. So Abraham stood up and bowed to the people of the land, the Hittites. And Abraham said to them, If you are willing to grant my dead a proper burial, listen to me and plead with Ephron the son of Zohar for me so that he may give, sell me, the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. Let him give it to me here in your presence, for the full price as a burial site, which I may keep forever among you. Now Ephron was present there among the sons of Heth. So within the hearing of all the sons of Heth, and all who were entering the gate of his city, Ephron the Hitti answered Abraham, saying, No, my lord, hear me. I give you the entire field, and I also give you the cave that is in it. In the presence of the men of my people I give, sell it to you, bury your dead there. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land. He said to Ephron, in the presence of the people of the land, If you will only please listen to me and accept my offer, I will give you the price of the field, accept it from me, and I will bury my dead there. Ephron replied to Abraham, My lord, listen to me. The land you seek is worth four hundred shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? So bury your dead. So Abraham listened to Ephron and agreed to his terms, and he weighed out for Ephron the amount of silver which he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, four hundred shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. So the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, Hebron, the field and the cave which was in it, 
and all the trees that were in the field and in all its borders around it were deeded over legally to Abraham as his possession in the presence of the Hittites, before all who were entering at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, to the east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave in it were deeded over to Abraham by the Hittites as a permanent possession and burial place. Genesis 24, A Bride for Isaac Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham said to his servant, Eliezer of Damascus, the oldest of his household, who had charge over all that Abraham owned, Please, put your hand under my thigh, as is customary for affirming a solemn oath, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but you will instead go to my former country, Mesopotamia, and to my relatives, and take a wife for my son Isaac, the heir of the covenant promise. The servant said to him, Suppose the woman will not be willing to follow me back to this country. Should I take your son back to the country from which you came? Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house, from the land of my family and my birth, who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, To your descendants I will give this land. He will send his angel before you to guide you, and you will take a wife from there for my son and bring her here. If the woman is not willing to follow you to this land, then you will be free from this my oath and blameless. Only you must never take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and set out, taking some of his master's good things with him. So he got up and journeyed to Mesopotamia between the Tigris and the Euphrates River to the city of Naor, the home of Abraham's brother. He made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of the evening when women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show loving kindness, faithfulness to my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here at the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the girl to whom I say, Please let down your jar, so that I may have a drink, and she replies, Drink, and I will also give your camels water to drink. May she be the one whom you have selected as a wife for your servant Isaac, and by this I will know that you have shown loving kindness, faithfulness to my master. Rebekah is chosen. Before Eliezer had finished speaking, praying, Rebekah came out with her water jar on her shoulder. Rebekah was the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Naor. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin and unmarried, and she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me drink a little water from your jar. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly lowered her jar to her hand and gave him a drink. When she had given Eliezer a drink, she said, I will also draw water for your camels until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trout and ran again to the well and drew water for all his camels. Meanwhile, the man stood gazing at Rebekah in reverent silence, waiting to know if the Lord had made his trip successful or not. When the camels had finished drinking, Eliezer took a gold ring, weighing a half shekel, and two bracelets for her hands, weighing ten shekels in gold, and said, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to lodge? And she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, Milcah's son, whom she bore to her husband Naor. Again she said to him, We have plenty of both straw and feed, and also room to lodge. The man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord. He said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not denied his loving kindness and his truth to my master. As for me, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brothers. Then the girl ran and told her mother's household what had happened. Now Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban. 
and Laban ran out to the man at the well. When he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms, and when he heard Rebekah his sister sang, the man said this to me, he went to Eliezer and found him standing by the camels at the spring. And Laban said, Come in, blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside, since I have made the house ready and have prepared a place for the camels? So the man came into the house, and Laban unloaded his camels and gave them straw and feed, and he gave water to Eliezer to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. But when food was set before him, he said, I will not eat until I have stated my business. And Laban said, Speak on. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become great, wealthy, powerful. He has given him flocks and herds, and silver and gold, and servants and maids, and camels and donkeys. Now Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was in her old age, and he has given everything that he has to him. My master made me swear an oath, saying, You must not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but you shall instead go to my father's house and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. Then I said to my master, But suppose the woman will not follow me back to this land. He said to me, The Lord before whom I walk habitually and obediently will send his angel with you to make your journey successful, and you will take a wife for my son from my relatives and from my father's house. Then you will be free of my oath. When you come to my relatives, and if they do not give her to you, you will also be free of my oath. I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, if now you will make my journey on which I go successful, please look. I am standing by the spring of water. Now let it be that when the maiden whom you have chosen for Isaac comes out to draw water, and to whom I say, Please give me a little water to drink from your jar, and if she says to me, You drink, and I will also draw water for your camels, let that woman be the one whom the Lord has selected and chosen as a wife for my master's son." Before I had finished praying in my heart, behold, Rebekah came out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew water. And I said to her, Please let me have a drink. And she quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will also water your camels. So I drank, and she also watered the camels. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? She said, The daughter of Bethuel, Naor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. And I put the ring in her nose and the bracelets on her arms. And I bowed down my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me in the right way to take the daughter of my master's brother to his son as a wife. So now if you are going to show kindness and truth to my master, being faithful to him, tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right or to the left and go on my way. Then Laban and Bethuel answered, The matter has come from the Lord, so we dare not speak bad or good to you about it. We cannot interfere. Rebekah is before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the ground in worship before the Lord. Then the servant brought out jewelry of silver, jewelry of gold, and articles of clothing, and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night there. In the morning, when they got up, he said, Now send me back to my master. But Rebekah's brother and mother said, Let the girl stay with us a few days, at least ten, then she may go. But Eliezer said to them, Do not delay me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away, so that I may go back to my master. And they said, we will call the girl and ask her what she prefers. So they called Rebekah and said, Will you go with this man? And she answered, I will go. So they sent off their sister Rebekah and her nurse Deborah as her attendant, and Abraham's servant Eliezer and his men. They blessed Rebekah and said to her, May you, our sister, become the mother of thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess, conquer, the city gate of those who hate them. Then Rebekah and her attendants stood, and they mounted camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and went on his way. Isaac marries Rebekah. 
Now Isaac had returned from going to Beer Lahairoi, well of the living one who sees me, for he was living in the Negev. Isaac went out to bow down in prayer in the field in the early evening. He raised his eyes and looked, and camels were coming. Rebekah also raised her eyes and looked, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel. She said to the servant, Who is that man there walking across the field to meet us? And the servant said, He is my master Isaac. So she took a veil and covered herself as was customary. The servant told Isaac everything that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah in marriage, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Therefore Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Genesis 25 Abraham's Death Abraham took another wife, whose name was Keturah. She gave birth to Zimran, Jokshan, Midan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan was the father of Sheba and Didan. The sons of Didan were Ashurim, Letushim, and Leumim. The sons of Midian were Ipha, Ifer, Hanok, Abida, and Elda. All these were the sons of Keturah. Now Abraham gave everything that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines Hagar and Keturah. Abraham gave gifts while he was still living, and he sent them to the east country, away from Isaac, his son of promise. The days of Abraham's life were a hundred and seventy-five years. Then Abraham breathed his last, and he died at a good old age, an old man who was satisfied with life. And he was gathered to his people who had preceded him in death. So his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hiti, which is east of Mamre, the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth. There Abraham was buried with Sarah his wife. Now after the death of Abraham, God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac lived at Beer Lahairoi, descendants of Ishmael. Now these are the records of the descendants of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maid, bore to Abraham. And these are the names of the twelve sons of Ishmael, named in the order of their births, Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, Adbil, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Maza, Hadad, Tima, Jetur, Navish, and Kedema. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names, by their settlements and by their encampments, sheepfolds, twelve princes, sheiks, according to their tribes. Ishmael lived a hundred and thirty-seven years, then he breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people who had preceded him in death. Ishmael's sons, descendants, settled from Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt as one goes toward Assyria. He settled opposite east of all his relatives. Isaac's sons. Now these are the records of the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was forty years old when he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel the Aramean, Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, because she was unable to conceive children, and the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah his wife conceived twins. But the children struggled together within her, kicking and shoving one another. And she said, If it is so that the Lord has heard our prayer, why then am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord, praying for an answer. The Lord said to her, The founders of two nations are in your womb, and the separation of two nations has begun in your body. The one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out reddish all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau, Harry. Afterward his brother came out, and his hand grasped Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob, one who grabs by the heel, subplanter. Isaac was sixty years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. When the boys grew up, Esau was an able and skilled hunter, a man of the outdoors. But Jacob was a quiet and peaceful man living in tents. Now Isaac loved and favored Esau because he enjoyed eating his game. But Rebekah loved and favored Jacob. Jacob had cooked reddish-brown lentil stew one day when Esau came from the field and was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, 
Please let me have a quick swallow of that red stuff there, because I am exhausted and famished. For that reason, Esau was also called Edom, red. Jacob answered, First, sell me your birthright, the rights of a firstborn. Esau said, Look, I am about to die if I do not eat soon. So of what use is this birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear an oath to me today that you are selling it to me for this food. So he swore an oath to him and sold him his birthright. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank, and got up and went on his way. In this way Esau scorned his birthright. Genesis 26 Isaac settles in Gerar. Now there was a famine in the land of Canaan, besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I will tell you. Live temporarily as a resident in this land, and I will be with you, and will bless and favor you. For I will give all these lands to you and to your descendants, and I will establish and carry out the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of the heavens, and will give to your descendants all these lands, and by your descendants shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because Abraham listened to and obeyed my voice, and consistently kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. The men of the place asked him about his wife, and he said, She is my sister. For he was afraid to say, My wife, thinking the men of the place might kill me on account of Rebekah, since she is very beautiful. It happened when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of a window and saw Isaac caressing Rebekah his wife. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, See here, Rebekah is in fact your wife. How did you dare to say to me, She is my sister? And Isaac said to him, Because I thought I might be killed because of her desirability. Abimelech said, What is this that you have done to us? One of the men among our people might easily have been intimate with your wife, and you would have brought guilt on us before God. Then Abimelech commanded all his people, Whoever touches this man Isaac or his wife Rebekah shall without exception be put to death. Then Isaac planted seed in that land as a farmer, and reaped in the same year a hundred times as much as he had planted, and the Lord blessed and favored him. And the man Isaac became great, and gained more and more, until he became very wealthy and extremely distinguished. He owned flocks and herds, and a great household with a number of servants, and the Philistines envied him. Now all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines stopped up by filling them with dirt. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from here, because you are far too powerful for us. So Isaac left that region and camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Quarrel over the wells. Now Isaac again dug and reopened the wells of water which had been dug in the days of Abraham his father, because the Philistines had filled them up with dirt after the death of Abraham, and he gave the wells the same names that his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of flowing spring water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So Isaac named the well Isek, quarreling, because they quarreled with him. Then his servants dug another well, and they quarreled over that also. So Isaac named it Sitna, Emeti. He moved away from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over that one. So he named it Rehoboth, broad places, saying, For now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be prosperous in the land. Then he went up from there to Beersheba. The Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham your father. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless and favor you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. So Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord in prayer. He pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well covenant with Abimelech. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with Ahuzoth, his close friend and confidential adviser, and Pichol, the commander of his army. Isaac said to them, Why have you people come to me, since you hate me and have sent me away from you? 
They said, We see clearly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, There should now be an oath between us, with a curse for the one who breaks it, that is, between you and us, and let us make a covenant, binding agreement, solemn promise, with you, that you will not harm us, just as we have not touched you and have done nothing but good to you and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed and favored of the Lord. Then Isaac held a formal banquet, covenant feast for them, and they ate and drank. They got up early in the morning and swore oaths, pledging to do nothing but good to each other. And Isaac sent them on their way, and they left him in peace. Now on the same day, Isaac's servants came and told him about the well they had dug, saying, We have found water. So he named the well Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. When Esau was forty years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hitti, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hitti, as his wives. And they were a source of grief to Esau's parents, Isaac and Rebekah. Genesis 27 Jacob's Deception Now when Isaac was old, and his eyes were too dim to see, he called his elder and favorite son, Esau, and said to him, My son. And Esau answered him, Here I am. Isaac said, See here, I am old. I do not know when I may die. So now please take your hunting gear, your quiver of arrows, and your bow, and go out into the open country and hunt game for me, and make me a savory and delicious dish of meat, the kind I love, and bring it to me to eat, so that my soul may bless you as my firstborn son before I die. But Rebekah overheard what Isaac said to Esau his son, and when Esau had gone to the open country to hunt for game that he might bring back, Rebekah said to Jacob her younger and favorite son, Listen carefully. I heard your father saying to Esau your brother, Bring me some game, and make me a savory and delicious dish of meat, so that I may eat it, and declare my blessing on you, in the presence of the Lord before my death. So now, my son, listen carefully to me, and do exactly as I command you. Go now to the flock, and bring me two good and suitable young goats, and I will make them into a savory dish of meat for your father, the kind he loves to eat. Then you shall bring it to your father to eat, so that he may bless you before his death. Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Listen, Esau my brother is a hairy man, and I am a smooth-skinned man. Suppose my father touches me and feels my skin, then I will be seen by him as a cheat, impostor, and I will bring his curse on me and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, May your curse be on me, my son. Only listen and obey me, and go, bring the young goats to me. So Jacob went and got the two young goats, and brought them to his mother, and his mother prepared a delicious dish of food, with a delightful aroma, the kind his father loved to eat. Then Rebekah took her elder son Esau's best clothes, which were with her in her house, and put them on Jacob her younger son. And she put the skins of the young goats on his hands, and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave her son Jacob the delicious meat and the bread which she had prepared. So he went to his father and said, My father. And Isaac said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done what you told me to do. Now please sit up and eat some of my game, so that you may bless me. Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found the game so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God caused it to come to me. But Isaac wondered and said to Jacob, Please come close to me so that I may touch you, my son, and determine if you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob approached Isaac, and his father touched him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He could not recognize him as Jacob, because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. But he said, Are you really my son Esau? Jacob answered, I am. Then Isaac said, Bring the food to me, and I will eat some of my son's game, so that I may bless you. He brought it to him, and he ate. And he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Please come, my son, and kiss me. So he came and kissed him, and Isaac smelled his clothing and blessed him and said, The scent of my son Esau is like the aroma of a field which the Lord has blessed. Now may God give you the dew of heaven to water your land 
and of the fatness fertility of the earth, and an abundance of grain and new wine. May peoples serve you, and nations bow down to you, be lord and master over your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and may those who bless you be blessed. The Stolen Blessing Now as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely left the presence of Isaac his father, Esau his brother came in from his hunting. Esau also made a delicious dish of meat and brought it to his father and said to him, Let my father get up and eat some of his son's game, so that you may bless me. Isaac his father said to him, Who are you? And he replied, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled violently, and he said, Then who was the one who was just here who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came, and I blessed him. Yes, and he in fact shall be, shall remain blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with a great and extremely bitter cry, and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. Isaac said, Your brother came deceitfully and has fraudulently taken away your blessing for himself. Esau replied, Is he not rightly named Jacob the supplanter? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and now he has taken away my blessing. Have you not reserved a blessing for me? But Isaac replied to Esau, Listen carefully. I have made Jacob your lord and master. I have given him all his brothers and relatives as servants, and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. Then Esau, no longer able to restrain himself, raised his voice and wept loudly. Then Isaac his father answered and prophesied and said to him, Your dwelling shall be away from the fertility of the earth and away from the dew of heaven above, but you shall live by your sword and serve your brother. However it shall come to pass, when you break loose from your anger and hatred, that you will tear his yoke off your neck, and you will be free of him. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are very near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. When these words of her elder son Esau were repeated to Rebekah, she sent for Jacob her younger son and said to him, Listen carefully. Your brother Esau is comforting himself concerning you by planning to kill you. So now, my son, listen and do what I say. Go, escape to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's anger subsides. When your brother's anger toward you subsides and he forgets what you did to him, then I will send and bring you back from there. Why should I be deprived of you both in a single day? Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I am tired of living because of the daughters of Heth, these insolent wives of Esau. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth, like these daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? Genesis 28 Jacob is sent away. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, you shall not marry one of the women of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take from there as a wife for yourself one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, so that you may become a great company of peoples. May he also give the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the promised land of your sojournings, which he gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob, and Esau. Now Esau noticed that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him to Padan Aram to take a wife for himself from there, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a prohibition, saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan, in that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. So Esau realized that his two wives, the daughters of Canaan, displeased Isaac his father. And to appease his parents, Esau went to the family of Ishmael and took as his wife, in addition to the wives he already had, Mahalath the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth, Ishmael's firstborn son.
Jacob's Dream Now Jacob left Beersheba, never to see his mother again, and traveled toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed overnight there because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down there to sleep. He dreamed that there was a ladder, stairway, placed on the earth, and the top of it reached out of sight toward heaven, and he saw the angels of God ascending and descending on it, going to and from heaven. And behold, the Lord stood above and around him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father's father, and the God of Isaac. I will give to you and to your descendants the land of promise on which you are lying. Your descendants shall be as countless as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and the east and the north and the south, and all the families, nations of the earth, shall be blessed through you and your descendants. Behold, I am with you, and will keep careful watch over you and guard you wherever you may go, and I will bring you back to this promised land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep, and he said, Without any doubt, the Lord is in this place, and I did not realize it. So he was afraid, and said, How fearful and awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gateway to heaven. So Jacob got up early in the morning, and took the stone he had put under his head, and he set it up as a pillar, that is, a monument to the vision in his dream, and he poured olive oil on the top of it to consecrate it. He named that place Bethel, the house of God. The previous name of that city was Luz, almond tree. Then Jacob made a vow, promise, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take, and will give me food to eat and clothing to wear, and if he grants that I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. The stone which I have set up as a pillar, monument, memorial, will be God's house, a sacred place to me, and of everything that you give me I will give the tenth to you, as an offering to signify my gratitude and dependence on you. Genesis 29 Jacob Meets Rachel Then Jacob went on his way and came to the land of the people of the east, near Haran. As he looked, he saw a well in the field, and three flocks of sheep lying there resting beside it, because the flocks were watered from that well. Now the stone on the mouth of the well that covered and protected it was large, and when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well, water the sheep, and afterward replace the stone on the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, My brothers, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. So he said to them, Do you know Laban, the grandson of Naor, Abraham's brother? And they replied, We know him. And he asked them, Is it well with him? And they said, He is doing well. Look, here comes his daughter Rachel with the sheep. Jacob said, Look, the sun is still high overhead. It is a long time before the flocks need to be gathered in their folds for the night. Water the sheep, and go, and return them to their pasture. But they said, We cannot leave until all the flocks are gathered together, and the shepherds roll the stone from the mouth of the well, then we will water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. When Jacob saw his cousin Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and Laban's sheep, He came up and rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and watered the flock of Laban, his uncle. Then Jacob kissed Rachel in greeting, and he raised his voice and wept. Jacob told Rachel he was her father's relative, Rebekah's son, and she ran and told her father. When Laban heard of the arrival of Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced and kissed him and brought him to his house. Then he told Laban all these things. Then Laban said to him, You are my bone and my flesh. And Jacob stayed with him a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Just because you are my relative, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you as a hired workman for seven years in return for the privilege of marrying Rachel, your younger daughter. 
Laban said, It is better that I give her in marriage to you than give her to another man. Stay and work with me. So Jacob served Laban for seven years for the right to marry Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Laban's Treachery Finally, Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my time of service is completed, so that I may take her to me as my wife. So Laban gathered together all the men of the place and prepared a wedding feast with wine. But in the evening he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob. And Jacob went in to consummate the marriage with her. Laban also gave Zilpah, his maid, to his daughter Leah as a maid. But in the morning, when Jacob awoke, it was Leah who was with him. And he said to Laban, What is this that you have done to me? Did I not work for you for seven years for Rachel? Why have you deceived and betrayed me like this? But Laban only said, It is not the tradition here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older. Finish the week of the wedding feast for Leah. Then we will give you Rachel also, and in return you shall work for me for seven more years. So Jacob complied and fulfilled Leah's week of celebration. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as his second wife. Laban also gave Bilhah his maid to his daughter Rachel as a maid. So Jacob consummated his marriage and lived with Rachel as his wife, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban for another seven years. Now when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he made her able to bear children, but Rachel was barren. Leah conceived and gave birth to a son, and named him Reuben. See, a son. For she said, Because the Lord has seen my humiliation and suffering, now my husband will love me since I have given him a son. Then she conceived again, and gave birth to a son, and said, Because the Lord heard that I am unloved, he has given me this son also. So she named him Simon, God hears. She conceived again, and gave birth to a son, and said, Now this time my husband will become attached to me as a companion, for I have given him three sons, therefore he was named Levi. Again she conceived and gave birth to a fourth son, and she said, Now I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then for a time she stopped bearing children. Genesis 30 The Sons of Jacob When Rachel saw that she conceived no children for Jacob, she envied her sister, and said to Jacob, Give me children, or else I will die. Then Jacob became furious with Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God, who has denied you children? She said, Here, Take my maid Bilhah and go into her, and when the baby comes, she shall deliver it while sitting on my knees, so that by her I may also have children to count as my own. So she gave him Bilhah her maid as a secondary wife, and Jacob went into her. Bilhah conceived and gave birth to a son for Jacob. Then Rachel said, God has judged and vindicated me, and has heard my plea, and has given me a son through my maid. So she named him Dan. He judged. Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again and gave birth to a second son for Jacob. So Rachel said, With mighty wrestlings in prayer to God, I have struggled with my sister and have prevailed. So she named him Naphtali, my wrestlings. When Leah saw that she had stopped bearing children, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob as a secondary wife. Zilpah, Leah's maid, gave birth to a son for Jacob. Then Leah said, how fortunate! So she named him Gad, good fortune. Zilpah, Leah's maid, gave birth to a second son for Jacob. Then Leah said, I am happy, for women will call me happy. So she named him Asher, happy. Now at the time of wheat harvest, Reuben, the eldest child, went and found some mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But Leah answered, it is a small thing that you have taken my husband. Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? So Rachel said, Jacob shall sleep with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came in from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must sleep with me tonight, for I have in fact hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he slept with her that night. God listened and answered the prayer of Leah, and she conceived and gave birth to a fifth son for Jacob. Then Leah said, God has given me my reward because I have given my maid to my husband. So she named him Issachar. Leah conceived again and gave birth to a sixth son for Jacob.
Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good marriage gift for my husband. Now he will live with me, regarding me with honor as his wife, because I have given birth to six sons. So she named him Zebulun. Afterward she gave birth to a daughter and named her Dinah. Then God remembered the prayers of Rachel, and God thought of her and opened her womb so that she would conceive. So she conceived and gave birth to a son, and she said, God has taken away my disgrace and humiliation. She named him Joseph, may he add, and said, May the Lord add to me another son. Jacob prospers. Now when Rachel had given birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me away so that I may go back to my own place and to my own country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, and let me go, for you know the work which I have done for you. But Laban said to him, If I have found favor in your sight, stay with me, for I have learned from the omens in divination and by experience that the Lord has blessed me because of you. He said, Name your wages, and I will give it to you. Jacob answered him, You know how I have served you, and how your possessions, your cattle, and sheep and goats have fared with me. For you had little before I came, and it has increased and multiplied abundantly. And the Lord has favored you with blessings wherever I turned. But now, when shall I provide for my own household? Laban asked, What shall I give you? Jacob replied, You shall not give me anything. But if you will do this one thing for me, which I now propose, I will again pasture and keep your flock. Let me pass through your entire flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep, and every dark or black one among the lambs, and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and those shall be my wages. So my honesty will be evident for me later, when you come for an accounting concerning my wages. Every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats, and dark among the young lambs, if found with me, shall be considered stolen. And Laban said, Good, let it be done as you say. So on that same day, Laban secretly removed the male goats that were streaked and spotted, and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one with white on it, and all the dark ones among the sheep, and put them in the care of his sons. And he put a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob was then left in care of the rest of Laban's flock. Then Jacob took branches of fresh poplar and almond and plane trees, and peeled white stripes in them exposing the white in the branches. Then he set the branches which he had peeled in front of the flocks in the watering troughs, where the flocks came to drink, and they mated and conceived when they came to drink. So the flocks mated and conceived by the branches, and the flocks gave birth to streaked, speckled, and spotted offspring. Jacob separated the lambs, and as he had done with the peeled branches, He made the flocks face toward the streaked and all the dark or black in the new flock of Laban, and he put his own herds apart by themselves and did not put them where they could breed with Laban's flock. Furthermore, whenever the stronger animals of the flock were breeding, Jacob would place the branches in the sight of the flock in the watering troughs so that they would mate and conceive among the branches. But when the flock was sickly, he did not put the branches there, So the sicker animals were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. So Jacob became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks of sheep and goats and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. Genesis 31. Jacob leaves secretly for Canaan. Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken away everything that was our father's, and from what belonged to our father he has acquired all this wealth and honor. Jacob noticed a change in the attitude of Laban, and saw that it was not friendly toward him as before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers, and to your people, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to his flock in the field, and he said to them, I see a change in your father's attitude, that he is not friendly toward me as he was before, but the God of my father Isaac has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me as often as possible, and changed my wages ten times, but God did not allow him to hurt me. If he said, The speckled shall be your wages, then the entire flock gave birth to speckled young, and if he said, The streaked shall be your wages, then the entire flock gave birth to streaked young. 
Thus God has taken away the flocks of your father and given them to me. And it happened at the time when the flock conceived that I looked up and saw in a dream that the rams which mated with the female goats were streaked, speckled, and spotted. And the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. He said, Look up and see. All the rams which are mating with the flock are streaked, speckled, and spotted. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar, and where you made a vow to me. Now stand up, leave this land, and return to the land of your birth. Rachel and Leah answered him, Is there still any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not counted by him as foreigners? For he sold us to you in marriage, and has also entirely used up our purchase price. Surely all the riches which God has taken from our father are ours, and our children's. Now then, whatever God has told you to do, do it. Then Jacob stood and took action, and put his children and his wives on camels. And he drove away all his livestock, and took along all his property which he had acquired, the livestock he had obtained and accumulated in Padan Aram, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. When Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel went inside the house and stole her father's household gods. And Jacob deceived Laban, the Aramean Syrian, by not telling him that he intended to leave and he slipped away secretly. So he fled with everything that he had, and got up and crossed the river Euphrates and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead, east of the Jordan River. Laban pursues Jacob. On the third day after his departure, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. So he took his relatives with him and pursued him for seven days, and they overtook him in the hill country of Gilead. God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream at night and said to him, Be careful that you do not speak to Jacob, either good or bad. Then Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent on the hill, and Laban with his relatives camped on the same hill of Gilead. Then Laban said to Jacob, What do you mean by deceiving me and leaving without my knowledge, and carrying off my daughters as if they were captives of the sword? Why did you run away secretly and deceive me and not tell me, so that otherwise I might have sent you away with joy and with songs, with music on the tambourine and lyre? And why did you not allow me to kiss my grandchildren and my daughters goodbye? Now you have done a foolish thing in behaving like this. It is in my power to harm you, but the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Be careful not to speak to Jacob, either good or bad. Now I suppose you felt you must go because you were homesick for your father's house and family, but why did you steal my household gods? Jacob answered Laban, I left secretly because I was afraid, for I thought you would take your daughters away from me by force. The one with whom you find your gods shall not live. In the presence of our relatives, search my possessions and point out whatever you find that belongs to you and take it. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the idols. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and the tent of the two maids, but he did not find them. Then he came out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household idols and put them in the camel's saddlebag and sat on them. Laban searched through all her tent, but did not find them. So Rachel said to her father, Do not be displeased, my lord, that I cannot rise before you, for the manner of women is on me, and I am unwell. He searched further, but did not find the household idols. Then Jacob became angry and argued with Laban. And he said to Laban, What is my fault? What is my sin that you pursued me like this? Although you have searched through all my possessions, what have you found of your household goods? Put it here before my relatives and your relatives, so that they may decide who has done right between the two of us. These twenty years I have been with you. Your ewes and female goats have not lost their young, nor have I eaten the rams of your flocks. I did not bring you the torn carcasses of the animals attacked by predators. I personally took the loss. You required of me to make good everything that was stolen, whether it occurred by day or night. This was my situation. By day the heat consumed me, and by night the cold, and I could not sleep. These twenty years I have been in your house. 
I served you fourteen years for your two daughters, and six years for my share of your flocks, and you have changed my wages ten times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the feared one of Isaac, had not been with me, most certainly you would have sent me away now empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and humiliation, and the exhausting labor of my hands, so he rendered judgment and rebuked you last night. The Covenant of Mizpah Laban answered Jacob, These women that you married are my daughters, these children are my grandchildren, these flocks are from my flocks, and all that you see here is mine. But what can I do today to these my daughters or to their children to whom they have given birth? So come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it serve as a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a memorial pillar. Jacob said to his relatives, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a mound of stones. And they ate a ceremonial meal together there on the mound of stones. Laban called it Jager Sehadutha, stone monument of testimony in Aramaic. But Jacob called it Galiad. Laban said, This mound of stones is a witness, a reminder of the oath taken today between you and me. Therefore he also called the dam Galiad. And Mizpah, a watchtower for Laban, said, May the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent from one another. If you should mistreat, humiliate, oppress my daughters, or if you should take other wives besides my daughters, although no one is with us as a witness, see and remember, God is witness between you and me. Laban said to Jacob, Look at this mound of stones, and look at this pillar which I have set up between you and me. This mound is a witness, and this pillar is a witness, that I will not pass by this mound to harm you, and that you will not pass by this mound and this pillar to harm me. The God of Abraham your father, and the God of Naor my father, and the God the image of worship of their father Terah, an idolater, judge between us. But Jacob swore only by the one true God, the fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice to the Lord on the mountain, and called his relatives to the meal, and they ate food and spent the night on the mountain. Early in the morning Laban got up and kissed his grandchildren and his daughters goodbye, and pronounced a blessing, asking God's favor on them. Then Laban left and returned home. Genesis 32 Jacob's Fear of Esau Then as Jacob went on his way, the angels of God met him to reassure and protect him. When Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's camp. So he named the place Mahanim, Double Camps. Then Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He commanded them, saying, This is what to say to my lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says this, I have been living temporarily with Laban, and have stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, and female servants, and I have sent this message to tell my Lord, so that I may find grace and kindness in your sight. The messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you, and there are four hundred men with him. Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people who were with him, and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps. And he said, If Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the other camp which is left will escape. Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your people, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and compassion, and of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. With only my staff, long ago, I crossed over this Jordan, and now I have become blessed and increased into these two groups of people. Save me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he will come and attack me and the mothers with the children. And you, Lord, said, I will certainly make you prosper and make your descendants as numerous as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be counted. So Jacob spent the night there. Then he selected a present for his brother Esau from the livestock he had acquired, two hundred female goats, twenty male goats, two hundred ewes, twenty rams, thirty milking camels with their colts, forty cows, ten bulls, 
twenty female donkeys and ten donkey colts. He put them into the care of his servants, every herd by itself, and said to his servants, Go on ahead of me, and put an interval of space between the individual herds. Then he commanded the one in front, saying, When Esau my brother meets you, and asks to whom you belong, and where you are going, and whose are the animals in front of you, then you shall say, They are your servant Jacob's, they are a gift sent to my lord Esau, and he also is behind us. And so Jacob commanded the second and the third as well, and all that followed the herd, saying, This is what you shall say to Esau when you meet him. And you shall say, Look, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said to himself, I will try to appease him with the gift that is going ahead of me. Then afterward I will see him, perhaps he will accept and forgive me. So the gift of the herds of livestock went on ahead of him, and he himself spent that night back in the camp. But he got up that same night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and waited over the ford of the Jabbok. Then he took them and sent them across the brook, and he also sent across whatever he had. Jacob wrestles. So Jacob was left alone, and a man came and wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he had not prevailed against Jacob, he touched his hip joint, and Jacob's hip was dislocated as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you declare a blessing on me. So he asked him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And he declared a blessing of the covenant promises on Jacob there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, the face of God saying, For I have seen God face to face, yet my life has not been snatched away. Now the sun rose on him as he passed Penuel, Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the Israelites do not eat the tendon of the hip which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh by the tendon of the hip. Genesis 33 Jacob meets Esau Then Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming with four hundred men. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids and their children in front, Leah and her children after them, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. Then Jacob crossed over the stream ahead of them and bowed himself to the ground seven times, bowing and moving forward each time until he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and hugged his neck and kissed him, and they wept for joy. Esau looked up and saw the women and the children and said, Who are these with you? So Jacob replied, They are the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids approached with their children, and they bowed down. Leah also approached with her children, and they bowed down. Afterward, Joseph and Rachel approached, and they bowed down. Esau asked, What do you mean by all this company which I have met? And he answered, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob replied, No, please. If now I have found favor in your sight, then accept my gift as a blessing from my hand. For I see your face as if I had seen the face of God, and you have received me favorably. Please accept my blessing, gift which has been brought to you, for God has dealt graciously with me, and I have everything that I could possibly want. So Jacob kept urging him, and Esau accepted it. Then Esau said, Let us get started on our journey, and I will go in front of you to lead the way. But Jacob replied, You know, my lord, that the children are frail and need gentle care, and the nursing flocks and herds with young are of concern to me. For if the men should drive them hard for a single day, all the flocks will die. Please let my Lord go on ahead of his servant, and I will move on slowly, governed by the pace of the livestock that are in front of me and according to the endurance of the children, until I come to my Lord in Seir in Edom. Then Esau said, Please let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But Jacob said, What need is there for it? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. 
So Esau turned back toward the south that day on his way to Seir. But Jacob journeyed north to Sokoth and built himself a house and made shelters for his livestock. So the name of the place is Sokoth, Huts, Shelters. Jacob settles in Shechem. When Jacob came from Padan Aram, he arrived safely and in peace at the city of Shechem, in the land of Canaan, and camped in front of the walled city. Then he bought the piece of land on which he had pitched his tents from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. There he erected an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. Genesis 34 The Treachery of Jacob's Sons Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had bore to Jacob, went out unescorted to visit the girls of the land. When Shechem the son of Hamor, the Havite, prince, Sheik of the land, saw her, he kidnapped her and lay intimately with her by force, humbling and offending her. But his soul longed for and clung to Dinah, daughter of Jacob. And he loved the girl and spoke comfortingly to her young heart's wishes. So Shechem said to his father Hamor, Give me this young woman as a wife. Now Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled, violated Dinah, his daughter. But his sons were in the field with his livestock. So Jacob said nothing until they came in. But Shechem's father Hamor went to Jacob to talk with him. Now when Jacob's sons heard of it, they came in from the field. They were deeply grieved, and they were very angry. For Shechem had done a disgraceful thing to Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter. For such a thing is not to be done. But Hamor conferred with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem deeply longs for your daughter and sister. Please give her to him as his wife. And beyond that, intermarry with us. Give your daughters to us as wives, and take our daughters for yourselves. In this way you shall live with us. The country will be open to you. Live and do business in it, and acquire property and possessions in it. Shechem also said to Dinah's father and to her brothers, Let me find favor in your sight, and I will give you whatever you ask of me. Demand of me a very large bridal payment and gift as compensation for giving up your daughter and sister, and I will give you whatever you tell me. Only give me the girl to be my wife. Jacob's sons answered Shechem and Hamor his father deceitfully, because Shechem had defiled and disgraced their sister Dinah. They said to them, We cannot do this thing and give our sister in marriage to one who is not circumcised, because that would be a disgrace to us. But we will consent to you only on this condition, if you will become like us, in that every male among you consents to be circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you in marriage, and we will take your daughters for ourselves, and we will live with you and become one people. But if you do not listen to us, and refuse to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter Dinah and go. Their words seemed reasonable to Hamar and his son Shechem, and the young man did not hesitate to do the required thing, for he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now he was more respected and honored than all others in the household of his father. Then Hamar and Shechem his son came to the gate of their walled city, where the leading men would meet, and spoke with the men of the city, saying, These men are peaceful and friendly with us, so let them live in the land and do business in it, for the land is large enough for us and for them. Let us take their daughters for wives, and let us give them our daughters in marriage. But only on this condition will the men consent to our request that they live among us and become one people, that every male among us become circumcised just as they are circumcised. Will not their cattle and their possessions and all their animals be ours if we do this? Let us consent to do as they ask, and they will live here with us. And every Canaanite man who went out of the city gate listened and considered what Hamar and Shechem said. And every male who was resident of that city was circumcised. Now on the third day after the circumcision, when all the men were terribly sore and in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Simon and Levi, Dinah's full brothers, took their swords, boldly entered the city without anyone suspecting them of evil intent, and they killed every male. They killed Hamar and his son Shechem with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah out of Shechem's house where she was staying, and left. Then Jacob's other sons came upon those who were killed and looted the town, because their sister had been defiled and disgraced. They took the Canaanites' flocks and their herds and their donkeys and whatever was in the city and in the field. They looted all their wealth, 
and took captive all their children and their wives, even everything that was in the houses. Then Jacob said to Simon and Levi, You have ruined me, making me a stench to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My men are few in number, and the men of the land will band together against me and attack me. I shall be destroyed, I and my household. But they said, Should he be permitted to treat our sister as a prostitute? Genesis 35 Jacob moves to Bethel. Then God said to Jacob, Go up to Bethel and live there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you in a distinct manifestation when you fled years ago from Esau your brother. Then Jacob said to his household, and to all who were with him, Get rid of the idols and images of foreign gods that are among you, and ceremonially purify yourselves and change into fresh clothes. Then let us get up and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the idols and images of the foreign gods they had, and the rings which were in their ears, worn as charms against evil, and Jacob buried them under the oak tree near Shechem. As they journeyed, there was a great supernatural terror sent from God on the cities around them, and for that reason the Canaanites did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is, Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. There he built an altar to worship the Lord, and called the place El Bethel, God of the house of God, because there God had revealed himself to him when he escaped from his brother. Now Deborah, who was once Rebekah's nurse, died and was buried below Bethel under the oak, and the name of it was called Alon Bakuth, Oak of Weeping. Jacob is named Israel. Then God, in a visible manifestation, appeared to Jacob again when he came out of Padan Aram and declared a blessing on him. Again God said to him, Your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he was called Israel, and God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall be born of your loins. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and to your descendants after you I will give the land. Then God ascended from Jacob in the place where he had spoken with him. Jacob set up a pillar, memorial monument, in the place where he had talked with God, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering of wine on it. He also poured oil on it to declare it sacred for God's purpose. So Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him Bethel, the house of God. Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath, Bethlehem, Rachel began to give birth and had difficulty and suffered severely. When she was in hard labor, the midwife said to her, Do not be afraid, you now have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she died, she named him Ben-Ani, son of my sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin, son of the right hand. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Jacob set a pillar, memorial, monument, on her grave, that is, the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel, Jacob, journeyed on and pitched his tent on the other side of the tower of Eder, the lookout point used by shepherds. While Israel was living in that land, Reuben, his eldest son, went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it, the sons of Israel. Now Jacob had twelve sons, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, then Simon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun the sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin, the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maid, Dan, and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maid, Gad, and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob, born to him in Padan Aram. Jacob came to Isaac his father at Mamre of Kiriath Arba, that is, Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had lived temporarily. Now the days of Isaac were a hundred and eighty years, Isaac's spirit departed, and he died, and was gathered to his people who had preceded him in death. An old man, full of days, satisfied, fulfilled. 
his sons Esau and Jacob buried him in the cave of Machpelah with his parents Abraham and Sarah. Genesis 36. Esau moves. Now these are the records of the descendants of Esau, that is, Edom. Esau took his three wives from the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hiddi, and Aholibama, the daughter of Anna, the son of Zibion the Hivite, and Basemath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebaioth. Ada bore Eliphaz to Esau, and Basemath bore Reuel, and Aholibama bore Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau, born to him in Canaan. Now Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters, and all the members of his household, and his livestock, and all his cattle, and all his possessions which he had acquired in the land of Canaan. And he went to a land away from his brother Jacob. For their great flocks and herds and possessions made it impossible for them to live together in the same region. The land in which they lived temporarily could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau lived in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom, descendants of Esau. These are the records of the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Ada, Esau's wife, and Reuel, the son of Asemath, Esau's wife. And the sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. And Timnah was a concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These are the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Reuel, Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These are the sons of Basemath, Esau's wife. And these are the sons of Aholibama, Esau's wife, the daughter of Anna, the son of Zibion. She bore to Esau Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the tribal chiefs of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, chiefs Timon, Omar, Zepho, Kenaz, Korah, Gatam, and Amalek. These are the chiefs of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. They are the sons of Ada. These are the sons of Reuel, Esau's son, chiefs Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, Mizah. These are the chiefs of Reuel in the land of Edom. They are the sons of Basemath, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Aholibama, Esau's wife, chiefs Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the chiefs born of Aholibama, daughter of Anna, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Esau, that is, Edom, and these are their chiefs. These are the sons of Seir, the Orite, the inhabitants of the land, Lotan, Shobal, Zabion, Anna, Deshon, Ezer, and Deshan. These are the chiefs of the Orites, the sons of Seir in the land of Edom, the sons of Lotan or Hori and Himam, and Lotan's sister is Timnah. The sons of Shobal are these, Alvan, Manahath, Ebal, Shepho, and Onam. These are the sons of Zabion, Aya, and Anna. This is the Anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness as he pastured the donkeys of Zibion his father. The children of Anna are these, Dishon and Aholibama, Esau's wife, the daughter of Anna. These are the sons of Dishon, Himdan, Ishban, Ithran, and Shiran. Ezer's sons are these, Bilhan, Zavan, and Akan. The sons of Dishon are these, Uz and Aram. The Orites chiefs are these, chiefs Lotan, Shobal, Zabion, Anna, Dishon, Izer, Dishan. These are the Orite chiefs, according to their various clans in the land of Seir. And these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. Bila, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Dinhaba. Now Bila died. And Jobab, the son of Zerah of Bozrah, reigned as his successor. Then Jobab died, and Husham, of the land of the Temanites, reigned as his successor. And Husham died. And Hadad, the son of Bedad, who defeated Midian in the country of Moab, reigned as his successor. The name of his walled city was Avith. Hadad died, and Samlah of Mazrika succeeded him. 
Then Samla died, and Shal of Rehoboth on the river Euphrates reigned as his successor, and Shal died, and Baal Hanan, son of Akbor, reigned as his successor. Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, died, and then Hadar reigned as his successor. His walled city was Pau. His wife's name was Maetabel, the daughter of Matred, the daughter of Nezahab. And these are the names of the tribal chiefs of Esau, according to their families and places of residence. By their names, chiefs Timna, Alva, Jeteth, Aholibama, Ela, Pinon, Kenaz, Timam, Mibzar, Magdil, and Aram. These are the tribal chiefs of Edom, that is, of Esau, the father of the Edomites, according to their dwelling places in the land of their possession. Genesis 37, Joseph's Dream So Jacob, Israel, lived in the land where his father Isaac had been a stranger, sojourner, resident alien, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when he was seventeen years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The boy was with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's secondary wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel, Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a distinctive multicolored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than all of his brothers, so they hated him and could not find it within themselves to speak to him on friendly terms. Now Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. He said to them, Please listen to the details of this dream which I have dreamed. We brothers were binding sheaves of grain stalks in the field, and lo, my sheaf suddenly got up and stood upright, and remained standing, and behold, your sheaves stood all around my sheaf and bowed down in respect. His brothers said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Are you really going to rule and govern us as your subjects? So they hated him even more for telling them about his dreams and for his arrogant words. But Joseph dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers as well. He said, See here, I have again dreamed a dream, and lo, this time I saw eleven stars, and the sun and the moon bowed down in respect to me. He told it to his father as well as to his brothers. But his father rebuked him and said to him in disbelief, What is the meaning of this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow down to the ground in respect before you? Joseph's brothers were envious and jealous of him. But his father kept the words of Joseph in mind, wondering about their meaning. Then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. Israel, Jacob, said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said, Here I am, ready to obey you. Then Jacob said to him, Please go and see whether everything is all right with your brothers and all right with the flock. Then bring word back to me. So he sent him from the Hebron valley, and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found Joseph, and saw that he was wandering around and had lost his way in the field. So the man asked him, What are you looking for? He said, I am looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are pasturing our flocks. Then the man said, They were here, but they have moved on from this place. I heard them say, Let us go to Datham. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Datham. The Plot Against Joseph and when they saw him from a distance, even before he came close to them, they plotted to kill him. They said to one another, Look, here comes this dreamer. Now then, come, and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits, cisterns, underground water storage. Then we will say to our father, A wild animal killed and devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Now Reuben, the eldest, heard this and rescued him from their hands, and said, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Do not shed his blood, but instead throw him alive into the pit, that is here in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him to kill him. He said this so that he could rescue him from them and return him safely to his father. Now when Joseph reached his brothers, they stripped him of his tunic, the distinctive multicolored tunic which he was wearing. 
Then they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty, there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat their meal. When they looked up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, east of the Jordan, with their camels bearing Ladanim resin for perfume and balm and myrrh, going on their way to carry the cargo down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What do we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Murder. Come, let us instead sell him to these Ishmaelites and Midianites, and not lay our hands on him, because he is our brother and our flesh. So his brothers listened to him and agreed. Then, as the Midianites and Ishmaelite traders were passing by, the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit, and they sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver. And so they took Joseph as a captive into Egypt. Now Reuben, unaware of what had happened, returned to the pit, and to his great alarm found that Joseph was not in the pit. So he tore his clothes in deep sorrow. He rejoined his brothers and said, The boy is not there. As for me, where shall I go to hide from my father? Then they took Joseph's tunic, slaughtered a male goat, and dipped the tunic in the blood. And they brought the multicolored tunic to their father, saying, We have found this. Please examine it and decide whether or not it is your son's tunic. He recognized it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn in pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes in grief and put on sackcloth and mourned many days for his son. Then all his sons and daughters attempted to console him, but he refused to be comforted and said, I will go down to Sheol, the place of the dead, in mourning for my son. And his father wept for him. Meanwhile in Egypt, the Midianites sold Joseph as a slave to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and the captain of the royal guard. Genesis 38, Judah and Tamar. Now at that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a certain Adullamite named Tyra. There Judah saw a daughter of Shua, a Canaanite, and he took her as his wife and lived with her. So she conceived and gave birth to a son, and Judah named him Ur. Then she conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. Again she conceived and gave birth to still another son and named him Shelah. It was at Chizib that she gave birth to him. Now Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn. Her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him in judgment. Then Judah told Onan, Go into your brother's widow, and perform your duty as a brother-in-law under the Leverite marriage custom. Be her husband and raise children for the name of your brother. Onan knew that the child, heir, would not be his, but his dead brother's. So whenever he lay with his brother's widow, he spilled his seed on the ground to prevent conception, so that he would not give a child to his brother. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord. Therefore he killed him also in judgment. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at your father's house until Shelah, my youngest son, is grown. But he was deceiving her, for he thought that if Shelah would marry her, he too might die like his brothers did. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. But quite a while after, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. And when the time of mourning was ended, he went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah with his friend Hira the Adulamite. Tamar was told, Listen, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she removed her widow's clothes and covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself up in disguise, and sat in the gateway of Enam, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah had grown up, and she had not been given to him as a wife as Judah had promised. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a temple prostitute, for she had covered her face as such women did. He turned to her by the road and said, Please come, let me lie with you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What will you give me that you may lie with me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, Will you give me a pledge as a deposit until you send it? He said, What pledge shall I give you? She said, Your seal and your cord, and the staff that is in your hand. 
So he gave them to her, and was intimate with her, and she conceived by him. Then she got up and left, and removed her veil, and put on her widow's clothing. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adulamite to get his pledge back from the woman, he was unable to find her. He asked the men of that place, Where is the temple prostitute who was by the roadside at Enam? They said, There was no prostitute here. So he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. Also the local men said, There was no prostitute around here. Then Judah said, Let her keep the things, pledge articles, for herself. Otherwise we will be a laughing stock, searching everywhere for her. After all, I sent this young goat, but you did not find her. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has played the role of a prostitute, and she is with child because of her immorality. So Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned to death as punishment. While she was being brought out, she took the things Judah had given her and sent them along with a message to her father-in-law, saying, I am with child by the man to whom these articles belong. And she added, Please examine them carefully and see clearly to whom these things belong, the seal and the cord and staff. Judah recognized the articles and said, She has been more righteous in this matter than I, because I did not give her to my son Shelah as I had promised. And Judah did not have intimate relations with her again. Now when the time came for her to give birth, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one baby put out his hand, and the midwife took his hand and tied a scarlet thread on it, saying, This one was born first. But he pulled back his hand, and his brother was born first. And she said, What a breach you have made for yourself to be the firstborn. So he was named Perez, breach, break forth. Afterward, his brother, who had the scarlet thread on his hand, was born, and was named Zerah, brightness. Genesis 39. Joseph's success in Egypt. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the royal guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he, even though a slave, became a successful and prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to prosper, succeed in his hand. So Joseph pleased Potiphar, and found favor in his sight, and he served him as his personal servant. He made Joseph overseer over his house, and he put all that he owned in Joseph's charge. It happened that from the time that he made Joseph overseer in his house, and put him in charge over all that he owned, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house because of Joseph. So the Lord's blessing was on everything that Potiphar owned, in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left all that he owned in Joseph's charge, and with Joseph there he did not need to pay attention to anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome and attractive in form and appearance. Then after a time his master's wife looked at Joseph with desire, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused, and said to his master's wife, Look, with me in the house my master does not concern himself with anything. He has put everything that he owns in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God and your husband? And so it was that she spoke to Joseph persistently day after day. But he did not listen to her plea to lie beside her or be with her. Then it happened one day that Joseph went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the men of the household was there in the house. She caught Joseph by his outer robe, saying, Lie with me. But he left his robe in her hand and ran, and got outside the house. When she saw that he had left his robe in her hand and had run outside, she called to the men of her household and said to them, Look at this, your master has brought a Hebrew into the household to mock and insult us. He came to me to lie with me, and I screamed. When he heard me screaming, he left his robe with me and ran outside the house. So she left Joseph's outer robe beside her until his master came home. Then she told her husband the same story saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought among us came to me to mock and insult me. 
Then, as soon as I raised my voice and screamed, he left his robe with me and ran outside the house. Joseph imprisoned. And when Joseph's master heard the words of his wife, saying, This is the way your servant treated me, his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. So he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended loving kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the warden. The warden committed to Joseph's care, management, all the prisoners who were in the prison, so that whatever was done there, he was in charge of it. The warden paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's care because the Lord was with him. Whatever Joseph did, the Lord made to prosper. Genesis 40. Joseph interprets a dream. Now some time later, the cupbearer, butler, and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their lord, Egypt's king. Pharaoh Sesostris II was extremely angry with his two officials, the chief of the cupbearers and the chief of the bakers. He put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the guard, in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard put Joseph in charge of them, and he served them, and they continued to be in custody for some time. Then the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, both dreamed a dream in the same night, each man with his own significant dream and each dream with its personal interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning and looked at them, he saw that they were sad and depressed. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in confinement with him in his master's house, Why do you look so downhearted today? And they said to him, we have each dreamed distinct dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. So Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a grapevine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. Then, as soon as it budded, its blossoms burst open, and its clusters produced ripe grapes in rapid succession. Now Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup. Then I placed the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches represent three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head, present you in public, and restore you to your position. And you will again put Pharaoh's cup into his hand, just as you did when you were his cupbearer. Only think of me when it goes well with you, and please show me kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For in fact I was taken, stolen, from the land of the Hebrews by unlawful force, and even here I have done nothing for which they should put me in the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation of the dream was good, he said to Joseph, I also dreamed, and in my dream there were three cake baskets on my head. And in the top basket there were some of all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds of prey were eating these foods out of the basket on my head. Joseph answered, This is the interpretation of it. The three baskets represent three days. Within three more days Pharaoh will lift up your head and will hang you on a tree, gallows, pole, and you will not so much as be given a burial, but the birds will eat your flesh." Now on the third day, which was the Pharaoh's birthday, he released the two men from prison and made a feast for all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker, that is, presented them in public among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his office, and the cupbearer once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But Pharaoh hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph had interpreted the meaning of the dreams to them. Yet, even after all that, the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot all about him. Genesis 41 Pharaoh's Dream Now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile, and lo, there came up out of the Nile seven healthy cows, sleek and handsome and fat, and they grazed in the reed grass in a marshy pasture. Then, behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the Nile, ugly and gaunt and raw-boned, and stood by the fat cows on the bank of the Nile. 
Then the ugly and gaunt and raw-boned cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. Then Pharaoh awoke. Then he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain came up on a single stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven ears of grain, thin and dried up by the east wind, sprouted after them. Then the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and it was a dream. So when morning came, his spirit was troubled and disturbed, and he sent and called for all the magicians and all the wise men of Egypt, and Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them to him. Then the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I would mention my faults today. Two years ago, Pharaoh was angry with his servants, and he put me in confinement in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker. We dreamed a dream on the same night, he and I. Each of us dreamed according to the significance of the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was with us, in the prison, a young man, a Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us, to each man according to the significance of his own dream. And just as he interpreted the dreams for us, so it happened. I was restored to my office as chief cupbearer, and the baker was hanged. Joseph interprets. Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when Joseph shaved himself and changed his clothes, making himself presentable, he came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. And I have heard it said about you that you can understand a dream and interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, It is not in me to interpret the dream. God, not I, will give Pharaoh a favorable answer through me. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream I was standing on the bank of the Nile, and seven fat, sleek, and handsome cows came up out of the river, and they grazed in the reed grass of a marshy pasture. Lo, seven other cows came up after them, very ugly and gaunt just skin and bones, such emaciated animals as I have ever seen in all the land of Egypt. And the lean and ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows. Yet when they had devoured them, it could not be detected that they had eaten them, because they were still as thin and emaciated as before. Then I awoke, but again I fell asleep and dreamed. I saw in my second dream seven ears of grain, plump and good, growing on a single stalk, and lo, seven other ears, withered, thin, and scorched by the east wind, sprouted after them. And the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. Now I told this to the magicians and soothsayers, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The two dreams are one and the same, and have one interpretation. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The two dreams are one and the same. The seven thin and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and also the seven thin ears, dried up and scorched by the east wind, they are seven years of famine and hunger. This is the message just as I have told Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Listen very carefully. Seven years of great abundance will come throughout all the land of Egypt, but afterward, seven years of famine and hunger will come, and there will be such desperate need that all the great abundance of the previous years will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, as if it never happened, and famine and destitution will ravage and destroy the land. So the great abundance will become forgotten in the land because of that subsequent famine, for it will be very severe. That the dream was repeated twice to Pharaoh, and in two different ways, indicates that this matter is fully determined and established by God, and God will bring it to pass very quickly. So now let Pharaoh prepare ahead, and look for a man discerning and clear-headed and wise, and set him in charge over the land of Egypt as governor under Pharaoh. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers and officials over the land, and set aside one-fifth of the produce of the entire land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Let them gather as a tax 
all of the fifth of the food of these good years that are coming, and store up grain under the direction and authority of Pharaoh, and let them guard the food in fortified granaries in the cities. That food shall be put in storage as a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine and hunger which will occur in the land of Egypt, so that the land people will not be ravaged during the famine. Now the plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all of his servants. Joseph is made a ruler of Egypt. So Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this, a man equal to Joseph, in whom is the divine Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since your God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and clear-headed and wise as you are. You shall have charge over my house, and all my people shall be governed according to your word and pay respect to you with reverence, submission, and obedience. Only in matters of the throne will I be greater than you in Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you in charge over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and dressed him in official vestments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in his second chariot, and runners proclaimed before him, Attention, bow the knee! And he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission shall no man raise his hand to do anything, or set his foot to go anywhere in all the land of Egypt. All classes of people shall submit to your authority." Then Pharaoh named Joseph zaphnath peniah and he gave him Azenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, Heliopolis in Egypt, as his wife. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt to inspect and govern it. Now Joseph had been in Egypt thirteen years, and was thirty years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Joseph departed from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt performing his duties. In the seven abundant years the earth produced handfuls for each seed planted, and Joseph gathered all the surplus food of the seven good years in the land of Egypt and stored enormous quantities of the food in the cities. He stored away in every city the food collected from its own surrounding fields. Thus Joseph gathered and stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea, until he stopped counting it, for it could not be measured. The Sons of Joseph Now two sons were born to Joseph before the years of famine came, whom Azenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, causing to forget, for he said, God has made me forget all my trouble and hardship and all the sorrow of the loss of my father's household. He named the second son Ephraim, fruitfulness, for God has caused me to be fruitful and very successful in the land of my suffering. When the seven years of plenty came to an end in the land of Egypt, the seven years of famine began to come, just as Joseph had said they would. The famine was in all the surrounding lands, but in the land of Egypt there was bread, food. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried out to Pharaoh for food. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph, do whatever he says to you. When the famine was spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold surplus grain to the Egyptians, and the famine grew extremely severe in the land of Egypt. And the people of all countries came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the known earth. Genesis 42, Joseph's brothers sent to Egypt. Now when Jacob, Israel, learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why are you staring at one another in bewilderment and not taking action? He said, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some grain for us, so that we may live and not die of starvation. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's younger brother, with his brothers, for he said, I am afraid that some harm or injury may come to him. So the sons of Israel came to Egypt to buy grain along with the others who were coming, for famine was in the land of Canaan also. 
Now Joseph was the ruler over the land, and he was the one who sold grain to all the people of the land. And Joseph's half-brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the ground. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But hiding his identity, he treated them as strangers and spoke harshly to them. He said to them, Where have you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Joseph remembered the dreams he had dreamed about them, and said to them, You are spies. You have come with a malicious purpose to observe the undefended parts of our land. But they said to him, No, my lord, for your servants have only come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. Yet he said to them, No, you have come to see the undefended parts of our land. But they said, Your servants are twelve brothers in all, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. Please listen, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no longer alive. Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies. In this way you shall be tested by the life of Pharaoh. You shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you back home, and let him bring your brother here, while the rest of you remain confined, so that your words may be tested, to see whether there is any truth in you and your story, or else by the life of Pharaoh certainly you are spies. Then Joseph put them all in prison for three days. Now Joseph said to them on the third day, Do this, and you may live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined in your place here in prison. But as for the rest of you, go, carry grain for the famine in your households. But bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified and you will not die. And they did so. And they said to one another, Truly we are guilty regarding our brother Joseph, because we saw the distress and anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us to let him go. Yet we would not listen to his cry, so this distress and anguish has come on us. Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you, do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? Now the accounting for his blood is required of us, for we are guilty of his death. They did not know that Joseph understood their conversation, because he spoke to them through an interpreter. He turned away from his brothers and left the room and wept. Then he returned and talked with them, and took Simon from them, and bound him in front of them to be kept as a hostage in Egypt. Then Joseph gave orders, privately, that their bags be filled with grain, and that every man's money used to pay for the grain be put back in his sack, and that provisions be given to them for the journey. And so this was done for them. They loaded their donkeys with grain and left from there. And at the lodging place, as one of them opened his sack to feed his donkey, he saw his money in the opening of his sack. And he said to his brothers, My money has been returned. Here it is in my sack. And their hearts sank, and they were afraid, and turned trembling to one another, saying, What is this that God has done to us? The return to Canaan. When they came to Jacob their father in the land of Canaan, they told him everything that had happened to them, saying, the man who is the Lord of the land spoke harshly to us, and took us for spies of the land. But we told him, We are honest men, we are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father, one is no longer alive. And the youngest is with our father today in the land of Canaan. And the man, the Lord of the country, said to us, By this test I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me, and take grain for your starving households, and go. Bring your youngest brother to me, then I will know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men. Then I will return your imprisoned brother back to you, and you may trade and do business in the land. Now when they emptied their sacks, every man's bundle of money paid to buy grain was in his sack. When they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me by causing the loss of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simon is no more, and you would take Benjamin from me. All these things are working against me. Then Reuben spoke to his father, You may put my two sons to death if I do not bring Benjamin back to you. Put him in my care, and I will return him to you. But Jacob said, 
My son shall not go down to Egypt with you, for his brother is dead, and he alone is left of Rachel's children. If any harm or accident should happen to him on the journey you are taking, then you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol, the place of the dead, in sorrow. Genesis 43 The Return to Egypt Now the famine was very severe in the land of Canaan, and it happened that when the families of Jacob's sons had finished eating all of the grain which they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again, buy us a little food. But Judah said to him, The man representing Pharaoh solemnly and sternly warned us, saying, You will not see my face again, unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother with us, we will go down to Egypt and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down there. For the man said to us, You will not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel, Jacob, said, Why did you treat me so badly by telling the man that you had another brother? And they said, The man asked us straightforward questions about ourselves and our relatives. He said, Is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we answered him accordingly. How could we possibly know that he would say, Bring your brother down here to Egypt? Judah said to Israel his father, Send the young man with me, and we will get up and go buy food, so that we may live and not die of starvation, we as well as you and our little ones. I will be security, a guarantee for him. You may hold me personally responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and place him safely before you, then let me bear the blame before you forever. For if we had not delayed like this, Surely by now we would have returned the second time. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choicest products of the land in your sacks, and carry it as a present of tribute to the man representing Pharaoh, a little balm and a little honey, aromatic spices or gum, resin, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Take double the amount of money with you, and take back the money that was returned in the opening of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take your brother Benjamin also, and get up, and go to the man. And may God Almighty grant you compassion and favor before the man, so that he will release to you your other brother Simon and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children Joseph, Simon, and Benjamin, I am bereaved. Then the men took the present, and they took double the amount of money with them, and Benjamin. Then they left and went down to Egypt, and stood before Joseph. Joseph sees Benjamin. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Bring the men into the house, and kill an animal, and make a meal ready, for the men will dine with me at noon. So the man did as Joseph said, and brought the men to Joseph's house. The men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house, and expecting the worst, they said, It is because of the money that was returned in our sacks the first time we came, that we are being brought in, so that he may find a reason to accuse us and assail us, and take us as slaves, and seize our donkeys. So they approached the steward of Joseph's house, and talked with him at the entrance of the house, and said, O oh, my Lord, we indeed came down here the first time to buy food, and when we arrived at the inn, after leaving here, we opened our sacks, and there was each man's money, with which he had paid for grain, in full, returned in the mouth of his sack. So we have brought it back this time. We have also brought down with us additional money to buy food. We do not know who put our money back in our sacks last time. But the steward encouraged them and said, Peace be to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has miraculously given you treasure in your sacks. I already had your money, which you paid to us. Then he brought Simon out to them. Then the steward brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed the dust off their feet, and he gave their donkeys feed. So they prepared the present of tribute for Joseph before his arrival at noon, for they had heard that they were to eat a meal there. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present of tribute which they had with them, and bowed to the ground before him. He asked them about their well-being, and said, Is your old father well, of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they answered, Your servant, our father, is in good health. 
he is still alive. And they bowed down their heads before Joseph in respect. And he looked up and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's only other son, and said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? And Joseph said, God be gracious to you and show you favor, my son. Then Joseph hurried out of the room because his heart was deeply touched over his brother, and he sought privacy to weep, so he entered his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out, and restraining himself said, Let the meal be served. So the servants served Joseph by himself in honor of his rank, and his brothers by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because according to custom the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews, for that is loathsome to the Egyptians. Now Joseph's brothers were seated by the steward before him in the order of their birth, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in astonishment because so much was known about them. Joseph selected and sent portions to them from his own table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. So they feasted and drank freely and celebrated with him. Genesis 44 The brothers are brought back. And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put every man's grain money in the mouth of the sack. Put my personal cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, with his grain money. And the steward did as Joseph had told him. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. When they had left the city and were not yet far away, Joseph said to his steward, Get up, follow after the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil to us for good paid to you? Is this not my Lord's drinking cup and the one which he uses for divination? You have done a great and unforgivable wrong in doing this. So the steward overtook them, and he said these words to them. They said to him, Why does my Lord speak these things? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Please remember, the money which we found in the mouths of our sacks we have brought back to you from the land of Canaan. Is it likely then that we would steal silver or gold from your master's house? With whomever of your servants your master's cup is found, let him die, and the rest of us will be my Lord's slaves. And the steward said, Now let it be as you say, He with whom the cup is found will be my slave, but the rest of you shall be blameless. Then every man quickly lowered his sack to the ground, and each man opened his sack, confident the cup would not be found among them. The steward searched, beginning with the eldest and ending with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes in grief, and after each man had loaded his donkey again, they returned to the city. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there, and they fell to the ground before him. Joseph spoke harshly to them, What is this thing that you have done? Do you not realize that such a man as I can indeed practice divination and foretell everything you do without outside knowledge of it? So Judah said, What can we say to my Lord? What can we reply? Or how can we clear ourselves, since God has exposed the sin and guilt of your servants? Behold, we are my Lord's slaves, the rest of us as well as he with whom the cup is found. But Joseph said, Far be it from me that I should do that. But the man in whose hand the cup has been found, he will be my servant. And as for the rest of you, get up and go in peace to your father. Then Judah approached him and said, O oh my Lord, please let your servant say a word to you in private, and do not let your anger blaze against your servant. For you are equal to Pharaoh, so I speak as if directly to him. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have you a father or a brother? We said to my Lord, We have an old father and a young brother, Benjamin, the child of his old age. Now his brother, Joseph, is dead, and he alone is left of the two sons born of his mother, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may actually see him. But we said to my Lord, The young man cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. You said to your servants, Unless your younger brother comes with you, you shall not see my face again. So when we went back to your servant, my father, we told him what my Lord had said. Our father said, 
Go back to Egypt and buy us a little food. But we said we cannot go down to Egypt. If our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down there. For we were sternly told that we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife Rachel bore me only two sons, and one son went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. If you take this one also from me, and harm or an accident happens to him, you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. Now therefore, when I come to your servant my father, and the young man is not with us, since his life is bound up in the young man's life, when he sees that the young man is not with us, he will die. And your servants will bring the gray hair of your servant our father down to Sheol in great sorrow. For your servant became security for the young man to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then let me bear the blame before my father forever. Now therefore, please let your servant Judah remain here instead of the youth to be a slave to my lord, and let the young man go home with his brothers. How can I go up to my father if the young man is not with me? For fear that I would see the tragedy that would overtake my elderly father if Benjamin does not return. Genesis 45 Joseph shows kindness to his brothers. Then Joseph could not control himself any longer in front of all those who attended him, and he called out, Have everyone leave me. So no man stood there when Joseph revealed himself to his brothers. Joseph wept aloud, and the Egyptians who had just left him heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless, for they were stunned and dismayed by the fact that they were in Joseph's presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come closer to me. And they approached him, and he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me ahead of you to save life and preserve our family. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five more years in which there will be no plowing and harvesting. God sent me to Egypt ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to keep you alive by a great escape. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his household, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father, and tell him, Your son Joseph says this to you, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall live in the land of Goshen, the best pasture land of Egypt and you shall be close to me, you and your children and your grandchildren, your flocks and your herds, and all you have. There I will provide for you and sustain you, so that you and your household and all that are yours may not become impoverished, for there are still five years of famine to come. Look, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that I am speaking to you personally in your language and not through an interpreter. Now you must tell my father of all my splendor and power in Egypt, and of everything that you have seen, and you must hurry and bring my father down here. Then he embraced his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. He kissed all his brothers and wept on them, and afterward his brothers talked with him. When the news was heard in Pharaoh's house that Joseph's brothers had come, it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Tell your brothers, do this. Load your animals and return to the land of Canaan without delay, and get your father and your households and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you will eat the fat, the finest produce of the land. Now you, brothers of Joseph, are ordered by Pharaoh, do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives, and bring your father and come. Do not be concerned with your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Then the sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh, and gave them provisions for the journey. To each of them Joseph gave changes of clothing, but to Benjamin he gave three hundred pieces of silver and five changes of clothing. To his father he sent the following, ten male donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, 
and ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and provision for his father to supply all who were with him on the journey. So he sent his brothers away, and as they departed, he said to them, See that you do not quarrel on the journey about how to explain this to our father. So they went up from Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob their father. And they said to him, Joseph is still alive, and indeed he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. But Jacob was stunned, and his heart almost stopped beating, because he did not believe them. When they told him everything that Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel Jacob said, It is enough. Joseph my son is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Genesis 46 Jacob moves to Egypt. So Israel set out with all that he had, and came to Beersheba, where both his father and grandfather had worshipped God, and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night, and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here I am. And he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. For I will make you, your descendants, a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you, your people, up again. And Joseph will put his hand on your eyes to close them at the time of your death. So Jacob sent out from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob and their children and their wives in the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And they took their livestock and the possessions which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and came to Egypt, Jacob and all his descendants with him, his sons and his grandsons, his daughters and his granddaughters, and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt, those who came to Egypt. Now these are the names of the sons of Israel, Jacob and his sons, who went to Egypt, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, the sons of Reuben, Hanok, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi, the sons of Simon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shal, the son of a Canaanite woman, the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Mirari, the sons of Judah, Er, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Er and Onan died in the land of Canaan, and the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. The sons of Issachar, Tola, Puva, Job, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulun, Sirid, Elon, and Jalil. These are the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob in Padan Aram, with his daughter Dinah. All of his sons and daughters numbered thirty-three. The sons of Gad, Zephion, Haggai, Shuni, Esbon, Iri, Arodi, and Areli. The sons of Asher, Imna, Ishva, Ishvi, Biriah, and Sarah, their sister, and the sons of Biriah, Heber, and Malchil. These are the sons of Zilpah, the maid, whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter, when she married Jacob. And she bore to Jacob these sixteen persons, two sons and fourteen grandchildren, the sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, Joseph, and Benjamin. Now to Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Azinath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, Heliopolis, in Egypt, bore to him, and the sons of Benjamin, Bela, Bichir, Ashbil, Gera, Naman, Ihai, Rosh, Mupim, Hupim, and Ard. These are the sons of Rachel, who were born to Jacob, there were fourteen persons in all, two sons and twelve grandchildren, the son of Dan, Hushim, the sons of Nephtali, Jazil, Goni, Jezer, and Shilim. These are the sons of Bilhah, the maid, whom Laban gave to Rachel, his daughter, when she married Jacob. And she bore these to Jacob. There were seven persons in all, two sons and five grandchildren. All the persons who came with Jacob into Egypt who were his direct descendants, not counting the wives of Jacob or Jacob's sons, were sixty-six persons in all. And the sons of Joseph, who were born to him in Egypt, were two. 
all the persons of the house of Jacob, including Jacob and Joseph his sons, who came into Egypt, were seventy. Now Jacob, Israel, sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph, to direct him to Goshen, and they came into the land of Goshen. Then Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to meet Israel his father in Goshen, as soon as he presented himself before him, authenticating his identity, he fell on his father's neck and wept on his neck a very long time. And Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die in peace, since I have seen your face and know that you are still alive. Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, My brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. And it shall be that when Pharaoh calls you and says, What is your occupation? You shall say, Your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth until now, both we and our fathers before us, in order that you may live separately and securely in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is repulsive to the Egyptians. Genesis 47 Jacob's family settles in Goshen. Then Joseph came and told Pharaoh, My father and my brothers, with their flocks and their herds, and all that they own, have come from the land of Canaan, and they are in the land of Goshen. He took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to his brothers, as Joseph expected, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and our fathers before us. Moreover, they said to Pharaoh, We have come to live temporarily, sojourn, in the land of Egypt, for there is no pasture for the flocks of your servants in our land, for the famine is very severe in Canaan. So now, please let your servants live in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen. And if you know of any men of ability among them, put them in charge of my livestock. Then Joseph brought Jacob, Israel, his father, and presented him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh asked Jacob, How old are you? Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life, and they have not reached the years that my fathers lived during the days of their pilgrimage. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh, and departed from his presence. So Joseph settled his father and brothers, and gave them a possession in Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, Goshen, as Pharaoh commanded. Joseph provided and supplied his father and his brothers, and all his father's household with food, according to the needs of their children. Now in the course of time, there was no food in all the land, for the famine was distressingly severe. So the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan languished in destitution and starvation because of the famine. Joseph gathered all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan in payment for the grain which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money was exhausted in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your very eyes? For our money is gone. Joseph said, Give up your livestock, and I will give you food in exchange for your livestock, since the money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and he gave them food in exchange for the horses and the flocks and the herds and the donkeys, and he supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. When that year was ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord the fact that our money is spent. My Lord also has our herds of livestock. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land in exchange for food and we and our land will be servants to Pharaoh, and give us seed to plant, that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. Result of the famine. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, 
For every Egyptian sold his field because the famine was severe upon them, so the land became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, he relocated them temporarily to cities from one end of Egypt's border to the other. Only the land of the priest he did not buy, for the priest had an allotment from Pharaoh, and they lived on the amount which Pharaoh gave them, so they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Look, today I have bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you, and you shall plant the land. At harvest time, when you reap the increase, you shall give one-fifth of it to Pharaoh, and four-fifths will be your own to use for seed for the field, and as food for you and those of your households and for your little ones. And they said, You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt, valid to this day, that Pharaoh should have the fifth part of the crops. Only the land of the priests did not become Pharaoh's. Now the people of Israel lived in the country of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they gained possessions and acquired property there, and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt seventeen years, so the length of Jacob's life was a hundred and forty-seven years. And when the time drew near for Israel to die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal loyally and faithfully with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but when I lie down with my fathers in death, you will carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place at Hebron in the cave of Machpelah. And Joseph said, I will do as you have directed. Then he said, Swear to me that you will do it. So he swore to him. Then Israel, Jacob, bowed in worship at the head of the bed. Genesis 48 Israel's Last Days Now some time after these things happened, Joseph was told, Your father is sick. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him to go to Goshen. And when Jacob, Israel, was told, Look now, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz, Bethel, in the land of Canaan, and blessed me, and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and numerous, and I will make you a great company of people, and will give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. Now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, that is, adopted as my heirs and sons as surely as Reuben and Simon are my sons. But other sons who were born to you after them shall be your own. They shall be called by the names of their two brothers in their inheritance. Now as for me, when I came from Padan in Mesopotamia, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the journey, when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath, and I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. When Israel, who was almost blind, saw Joseph's sons, he said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, They are my sons, whom God has given me here in Egypt. So he said, Please bring them to me, so that I may bless them. Now Israel's eyes were so dim from age that he could not see clearly. Then Joseph brought them close to him, and he kissed and embraced them. Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face, but see, God has shown me your children as well. Then Joseph took the boys from his father's embrace, and he bowed before him with his face to the ground. Then Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel's left, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right, and brought them close to him. But Israel reached out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, crossing his hands intentionally, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. Then Jacob Israel blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked in faithful obedience, the God who has been my shepherd, leading and caring for me all my life to this day, the angel 
that is, the Lord himself, who has redeemed me continually from all evil, bless the boys, and may my name live on in them. May they be worthy of having their names linked with mine, and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they grow into a great multitude in the midst of the earth. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on Ephraim's head, it displeased him because he was not the firstborn, and he grasped his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Place your right hand on Manasseh's head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. Manasseh also will become a people, and he will be great. But his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. Then Jacob blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce a blessing, saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. And he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die, but God will be with you and bring you back to Canaan, the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given you the birthright, one portion, Shechem, one mountain ridge, more than any of your brothers, which I took, reclaiming it from the hand of the Amorites, with my sword and with my bow. Genesis 49, Israel's prophecy concerning his sons. Then Jacob called for his sons and said, Assemble yourselves around me, that I may tell you what will happen to you and your descendants in the days to come. Gather together and hear, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, Jacob your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength and vigor, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power, that should have been your birthright, but unstable and reckless and boiling over like water in sinful lust, you shall not excel or have the preeminence of the firstborn, because you went up to your father's bed with Bilhah, you defiled it, he went up to my couch. Simon and Levi are brothers, equally headstrong, deceitful, vindictive, and cruel. Their swords are weapons of violence and revenge. O oh, my soul, do not come into their secret counsel. Let not my glory, honor, be united with their assembly, for I knew nothing of their plot, because in their anger they killed men, and honored man, Shechem, and the Shechemites, and in their self-will they lamed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide and disperse them in Jacob, and scatter them in the midst of the land of Israel. Judah, you are the one whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down to you, Judah, a lion's cub. With the prey, my son, you have gone up high the mountain. He stooped down, he crouched like a lion, and like a lion who dares rouse him. The scepter of royalty shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh, the Messiah, the peaceful one, comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Tying his foal to the strong vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he washes his clothing in wine, because the grapevine produces abundantly, and his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker and sparkle more than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. Zebulun shall dwell at the seashore, and he shall be a haven, landing place for ships, and his flank shall be toward Sidon. Issachar is like a strong-boned donkey, crouching down between the sheepfolds. When he saw that the resting place was good, and that the land was pleasant, he bowed his shoulder to bear burdens, and became a servant at forced labor. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a venomous serpent in the way, a fanged snake in the path, that bites the horse's heel, so that his rider falls backward. I wait for your salvation, O Lord. As for Gad, a raiding troop shall raid him. But he shall raid at their heels and assault them victoriously. Asher's food supply shall be rich and bountiful, and he shall yield and deliver royal delights. Nephtali is a doe let loose, a swift warrior, which yields branched antlers, eloquent words. Joseph is a fruitful bough, 
a main branch of the vine, a fruitful bough by a spring, a well, a fountain. Its branches run over the wall, influencing others. The skilled archers have bitterly attacked and provoked him. They have shot at him and harassed him, but his bow remained firm and steady in the strength that does not fail, for his arms were made strong and agile by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob, by the name of the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your father, who will help you, and by the Almighty, who blesses you, with blessings of the heavens above, blessings lying in the deep that couches beneath, blessings of the nursing breast and of the fertile womb. The blessings of your father are greater than the blessings of my ancestors, Abraham and Isaac. Up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the head of Joseph, even on the crown of the head of him who was the distinguished one and the one who is prince among separate from his brothers. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he devours the prey, and at night he divides the spoil. All these are the beginnings of the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each one according to the blessing appropriate to him. He charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron, the Hiti, in the cave in the field at Machpelah, east of Mamre, in the land of Canaan, that Abraham bought, along with the field from Ephron, the Hiti, to possess as a burial site. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife, there they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife, and there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it was purchased from the sons of Heth. When Jacob, Israel, had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet into the bed and breathed his last, and was gathered to his people who had preceded him in death. Genesis 50 Burial Preparations and Mourning for Jacob Then Joseph fell upon his father's face, and wept over him, and kissed him tenderly. Then Joseph ordered his servants, the physicians, to embalm, mummify his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel, Jacob. Now forty days were required for this, for that is the customary number of days of preparation required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept and grieved for him in public mourning as they would for royalty, for seventy days. When the days of weeping and public mourning for him were past, Joseph spoke to the nobles of the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your sight, please speak to Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear an oath, saying, Hear me, I am about to die. Bury me in my tomb, which I prepared for myself in the land of Canaan. So now let me go up to Canaan, please, and bury my father, then I will return. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to Canaan to bury his father, and with him went all the officials of Pharaoh, the nobles of his court and the elders of his household, and all the nobles and the elders of the land of Egypt, and all the household of Joseph, and his brothers and his father's household. They left only their little ones and their flocks and herds in the land of Goshen. Both chariots and horsemen also went up to Canaan with Joseph, and it was a very great company. When they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they mourned there with a great lamentation, expressions of mourning for the deceased, and extreme demonstrations of sorrow, according to the Egyptian custom. And Joseph observed a seven-day mourning for his father. When the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Etad, they said, This is a grievous mourning for the Egyptians. Therefore the place was named Abel Mizram, mourning of Egypt. It is west of the Jordan. Burial at Machpelah. So Jacob's sons did for him as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah east of Mamre, which Abraham bought along with the field as a burial site from Ephron the Hitti. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and all who had gone up with him. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph carries a grudge against us 
and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him. So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father commanded us before he died, saying, You are to say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. Now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers went and fell down before him in confession. Then they said, Behold, we are your servants, slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? Vengeance is his, not mine. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring about this present outcome, that many people would be kept alive as they are this day. So now do not be afraid. I will provide for you and support you and your little ones. So he comforted them, giving them encouragement and hope, and spoke with kindness to their hearts. Death of Joseph Now Joseph lived in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived a hundred and ten years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's children. Also the children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were born and raised on Joseph's knees. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die. But God will surely take care of you and bring you up out of this land to the land which he promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give you. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel, Jacob, swear an oath, saying, God will surely visit you and take care of you, returning you to Canaan. And when that happens, you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt.